right, welcome back to the channel, or welcome if you're new. I'm doing something different today. Maybe for a little while in the future, I'm actually having a great deal of fun with the new format. So, I was playing around with Legacy for a bit, I've been playing for Vintage, I've been looking for an old school feel, and uh, once again my friend Brian suggested to me um, that I take a look at a format that I hadn't heard of, uh, since he's generally has his ear to the railroad tracks as it were or ear to the ground I guess he, he, he kind of has a better feel for what's going on with things uh, so he suggested pre-modern and pre-modern if you're not familiar with it so it's a uh, it is a um, essentially it's like old school extended is the way I would describe it um, it's everything after th uh, revised uh, up until they started printing modern cards. So, if it's if it's got the new border and it was never printed before, then it's uh, not going to be legal. And if it's only legal in revised or unlimited alpha or beta, if, if it's only legal there and never reprinted in fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh edition, etc., then it also will not be legal in pre-modern. In addition to that, there's also a ban list, a specific ban list. Um, that's designed to, um, I guess, add some diversity to the format. Um, some of these I agree with. Some of them I don't. It doesn't really matter because this is the band list that we have. Um, some of them I'm sad to see, but I do understand. And on the other side of things, I think there's maybe a card or two missing from this list that probably should be here. I think the number one card that kind of stands out to me is... Um, Goblin and Lackey. I'm not exactly sure why that card's legal. The other one that stands out to me is Gaia's Cradle. These both seem kind of ridiculous. I don't fully understand why cards that generate sometimes multiple black lotuses worth of mana starting as early as turn one or two, usually turn two. I don't know why those would be legal, but having said that, you can take a look at the ban list here. Um, it's funny to see balance on here, but I think Wizards was still reprinting balance in the core set at the time of fourth edition. Um, so you can see Brainstorm is uh, banned. My Sage, I guess they don't like the consistency for blue. Uh, Force of Will is banned. This one's super painful, especially when you have cards like Goblin Lackey legal. Uh, definitely makes things pretty challenging. Flash, I love to see it. And Tomb, great. Earthcraft, Demonic Consultation, of course, all the anti-cards. Channel, yes, I agree with all of these choices here. Brainstorm and Force of Will are very painful. Balance, yeah, it makes me sad, but I understand it. Uh, land tax, I get, but don't necessarily love. This one's another funky one. Mana Vault, great. Grim, sure. Recruiter, yeah, absolutely, but this is not... To me, this is... I, I am much, much more concerned with Goblin Lackey than I am with the Goblin Recruiter. Mine Twist, yeah, of course. Strip Mine, get it. Um, in fact, all of these really pretty much make sense to me. All the rest of these I understand and agree with, even if I'm, you know, the mildest bit sad because I do enjoy playing with some of these cards. But if I really want to get my fix for these, I can always go play Commander. Most of these, you know, cards that I would like to play with are legal in um, Commander, so if I want to get my fix, I'll go there. And back in the day, while it's true that Necropotence was unrestricted for a while, eventually it got uh, taken out of the card pool, it got banned, um, and a lot of these are the cards like Memory Jar and stuff got banned, so a lot of these things just just make sense. But a few of them, they're, like I said, they're a little iffy, but I understand what they're doing here um, and why they're doing it. What's really nice about this site, if you're not familiar with it, you can go to premodernmagic.com and you can actually see um, you can click on the set. So like, let's say I want to see what's legal in 4th edition. I don't remember, right? I can scroll down, you know, show me all the cards and if a card's banned, boom, they band stamp it, which is really cool actually. Band stamped, right? So it makes for some nice um, nice options here. I'm also really pleased that they do not do the dumb thing, in my view, and ban, like, where is it? Is it even in the list? Uh, hold on. There it is. Crusade, right? Crusade's a card that Wizards says is 
unsensitive. Um, bro, I, I, that to me, that's like, uh, yeah, I get it, but um, maybe not, maybe yes, but it's that's really like getting in the feels on this one. Um, I guess there was some sort of crusade to get this card banned, but uh, it was actually a super important card for White Weenie for the whole time that it was legal. It's like one of the backbones for that deck. So the fact that they have it legal in this format rather than banned is great because it more properly reflects exactly how the format um, played out. Incidentally, for those of you who enjoy such a thing, Dark Ritual is legal and so is Hypnotic Spectre. We come down here. So Ritual's legal and yeah, Hippie's legal. They were both printed in uh, fourth edition. So you can go first turn Hypnotic Spectre. Um, However, because Alliances isn't legal in here... Oh, wait. Yeah, no, Alliances is legal. Scar... Excuse me. Um, but... Let me take a look here. And make sure that I'm making sense before I say what I'm about to say. Um, there's no Sinkhole, because that would have been, I think, Revised was when, when Sinkhole was around. So you don't get to go Dark Ritual, Not Expector, and then Sinkhole. And uh, EFGH, I, I can't remember what, when was him to Torog printed? Oh, Fallen Empires, Fallen Empires. And Fallen Empires is not on the list here. So there's actually no him to Torog, which is really nice. You can actually go in and you can actually see, I think somewhere in here there's a place where you can click where you can see every single card that's legal. So if you want to mess with that. All right, so that's kind of how it is. And uh, um, what it does is it makes for a lot of the, um, the, Players like me, pretty happy when, uh, like, I actually started playing uh, right during Revised, so I wasn't really super aware of cards until, like, the first cards I really spent money on was 4th Edition and Ice Age. So for me, this was, this is literally how I started playing. Um, and uh, you can see here there's a little About section where they're talking about why they did what they did. And that they also have an active community, so if you have input, I guess they're willing to listen. I'm generally I don't get involved in those things other than you know my YouTube channel, but maybe maybe I'll jump in there and suggest something to them. Uh, but uh, yeah, anyway, I want to run you through some games and some decks that I built. So I've I built uh, three pre-modern decks, and I'll show you how you can play as well. So if you go into first of all, we'll start with that. If you go into constructed Magic Online specialty, there's a free form tournament practice, and if you see this right here people put pre-modern in their tags or like in my case i put pre-modern and then a link to my channel right so that way people know what um what to expect and yeah you can get games and i've been i've been playing for i want to say like days now and uh man this format's really fun it's hard to stop playing it's super fun because the games are a back and forth battle a lot of times there are blowout scenarios probably the biggest one is goblin lackey like i was saying you know it's first turn lackey second turn um sometimes uh, you know hits you put into play a uh, siege gang commander and you just like, go okay i'm dead you know but um or hits you play um the goblin that reveals the top four cards of their library and puts all the goblins into their hand and they put, play another lackey and another lackey and you're like i don't have a board sweep on turn two or turn one it's my first turn right i'm dead like if they go first and they go lackey and you go land uh no plow no bolt and then they just like win the game so i i think that's kind of dumb but on the other hand like this deck also can do some blowout stuff because it's an ultra druids deck although back in the day i'm like now when you used to when you would oath um Back in the day, Oath of Druids didn't, like, pop out Emrakul's, Grizzlebrand's, Atraxas, like, things that just end the game on the spot just by showing up to the battlefield. You had to make do with stuff like Acroma and then hope that it got there, or Phantom Neshoba, or Spike Weaver, and hope that casting Fog three times was enough to buy you tempo and win a game. You actually had to play Magic, and that's what I love about the format. That's what I miss so much about the format. So, I tried three builds um and i'm not going to necessarily run through games for all of them i've actually played one of the, the decks uh, sorry about the lighting here it's pretty bad it's really washing me out let's see if i can turn so 
I played three builds. Um, the first one I started with was essentially a redo of the Legacy deck that I was testing before, which was very much a, a, a close enough to a pre-modern deck. And it's this um, Trix build. Um, it's a pretty good deck. It's uh, not bad. It's very single-minded. Um, has a lot of disruption. Really focuses on just doing what it does, um, which is basically ultimately going to be casting illusions of grandeur uh, and then donating it to your opponent so that when they can't pay the cumulative upkeep it dies and um, you gain 20 life when it comes into play they lose 20 life when it leaves play rather than you know you gain 20 and then lose 20 yourself so that's kind of the purpose of that deck it's a little challenging to run because um, because they cut it off at revised and this was an interesting decision that they made um, there's it's a little more challenging to build decks in some ways because uh, first off you do have enemy dual uh, enemy pain lands like this but you have no dual lands you also have fetch lands but you only have um, but you don't have any duels like so uh, again repeating that myself but there's no um, there's no watery graves there's no underground uh, seas there's no uh, try lands right so you can have fetches but they go get basics so i started out and then also um i'm not even sure i think that the only fetch lands at the time that existed were on color fetches also i don't i i think i don't think that there are any off color fetches um i think those got printed later so um the mana base actually pushes you to play cooperative colors and pushes you away from playing enemy colors it actually gets quite hard to play a deck like this and build your mana base in such a way that you'll have like consistency for example if i get the wrong hand with this deck i might have you know mountain wasteland um you know mountain wasteland uh, uh shivan reef maybe i have four spike and some other stuff i put a waste to shivan reef and now i'm just sitting there with like a mountain and a wasteland twiddling my thumbs basically dying right um, and that can happen pretty easily because the mana bases can be a lot more fragile. Um, so there is that to consider. It's one of the things that's interesting about the format. Anyway, I don't want to talk too much about this deck. I find this deck to be a good test deck. It is not, and it is fun to play, but it's not, it doesn't excite, excite me. It doesn't do it for me. It's just a good deck to play around with and see, you know, what you got going on. The next deck I built is a deck that I qualified uh, for the Pro Tour with back in the day, um, twice actually, a version of this deck. Um, actually, uh, to be clear, I actually qualified with Madness and Psychotog. And so the next deck I built was Psychotog. Um, but I did it within the same season. And the story behind that is that I, I qualified for the PTQ, but I was so confident that um, I would be able to win that my opponent offered me a, a, a price split and back then you could do a price split and, and uh, at least my understanding was that it was all on the up and up like we discussed it in front of everybody we weren't like hiding anything and this was back in the day right so he offered me a price split and basically said I'll give you all the prize like um, all of the second place and all of first place prize money and winnings but I want you to concede you'll be second place you'll get all that and I'll get the trip to the Pro Tour and I really wanted to go to the Pro Tour and I was like uh, well I think I can actually qualify again because there was another qualifier the next week and I said sure you know what I'll take it because it was like 500 bucks and a, um, and a um, box of cards right so like about six something in value and back then that was worth quite a bit more now that buys you you know a happy meal but anyway um I, I guess it's not that bad but still it bought three times probably as much as what it's worth now so that'd be like 1500 bucks right so i was like, yeah heck yeah so uh so i conceded to my to that guy and then the next week i played um i played and that was played with uh, psychotog so Basically, this deck, uh, maybe a slight. There was there were some differences. I think I was using Sh Shadow Mage Infiltrators and some other things that had to do with the meta that I was in. But basically, 
very similar to this deck. I think there were also a couple cards that are in here that weren't legal. Like, this pool is actually broader than the pool that I was able to play from because it was block. But, yeah, so I basically qualified with this deck. Took the prize split and then went and played um, the next week and qualified with Madness and won that one as well. And uh, ended up at uh, one of the Pro Tours, which was pretty cool. I, I can't remember if that was... Barcelona or if that was Lido but those were the two those were the two pro tours that I queued for and and actually went to um, so anyway <laughs> so I started here because you know I obviously have a fondness for well decks that got me wins um, and you can kind of take a look at it sorry I keep hitting the keyboard here but you can kind of take a look and see what's going on essentially what I've identified oops there it goes again what I've identified is that the um, well and this shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody who's familiar with the format, but um, Factor Fiction is one of the strongest card drawing abilities that you have, along with uh, Skeletal Scrying, certainly up there, and Accumulated Knowledge. Like These three things are very, very powerful um, draw engines. And so, um, and but what I've noticed is, as I've been playing, and, and I think you'll see it through the games, I'm not actually seeing other players play Factor Fiction and basically nobody playing accumulated knowledge either i haven't really seen that um but it works great accumulated knowledge specifically works really well in tricks it's basically the engine that fuels it as, as this factor fiction because of um sapphire medallion and it works really great in here because you have nightscape familiar who is a a regenerating sapphire medallion and um it so it, it gives you like a really nice curve but it also works really great in here because you have the Cunning Wish package for, and one of the cards you can get is Skeletal Scrying. So if you're playing against someone else who's also playing Accumulated Knowledges and you can time things correctly, you can um, either let them AK first and then you follow with your AKs in order to draw more cards than they do and get further ahead. Or you can set something up with a Cunning Wish for a Skeletal Scrying so that you're Accumulated Knowledging and then when they go to capitalize on the back of yours, you exile them as part of Skeletal Scrying's additional cost, and then they're only going to potentially benefit from the accumulated knowledge in their graveyard. Because one of the ways that you play AK, if you're not familiar with this card, uh, it, it was such a fun card to play with. You draw a card, and then count the number of accumulated knowledges in all graveyards, and draw a card equal to that number as well. You draw it all, all as a package. So... So in uh, tricks, you know, you intuition three of these, two of them go to your graveyard, the third one goes to your hand, and then you cast it, and it's like an ancestral recall, because you have two in the graveyard plus the one for a total of three cards that you draw. Um, here, I don't have intuition, but you can factor fiction them into your graveyard, and of course you can just get them through naturally course of playing. And as I was saying, if your opponent is also playing them, you can let them run out like the AK, the first one they draw one, the second one they draw two, and then you cast the third one and draw three. You're now way ahead, and um, they only have two left in their deck, while you have three left in yours, which would draw you four, five, and six, or even more cards, depending on how it goes. You can often just crush somebody that way. But, like I was saying, with Skeletal Scrying, you also have the option to potentially go first, and then when they cast their Accumulated Knowledge, trying to draw three and piggyback off of your two previous AKs or whatever, you can just scry them out of the graveyard, and then they, they don't get as good of a... Of a they don't get that same scenario, basically. So this is kind of um, how this deck goes, and we'll, we'll take a look at it. But basically, it's a uh, it's a pure control deck. And uh, if you have never seen Doctor Teeth, uh, Psychic Dog, name being because of the uh, picture here, this card is deceptively powerful. It's deceptive because it looks like crap. At three mana, one two, you have to discard cards to pump it, and it's not permanent. And then you can exile two cards from your graveyard to pump it. It just seems so bad, right? It seems so bad. But you have to realize that you churn through cards in this deck. You you fuel so many cards in this deck. You're throwing cards in this deck left and right. And as you're doing that, um, you're setting up a Psychotog that's just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. In addition to that, he also his discard effect also powers up this um, circular logic. You do have to be a bit careful about exiling cards too many um, because then the circular logic won't uh, counter a spell but basically for one blue you can counter a spell most of the time this is just one blue counter spell which is incredible and so um, and so uh, 
there's no like wonder or anything else in here. Basically, you just generate card advantage. You can trade off cards in graveyard for blockers until they have no blockers or edict or smother them, or you can cunning wish for like capsize and get them out of the way or, or, or other removal. But once you get to a certain point in this in the in the game, um, basically it's it's totally inevitable. Psychotog is gonna usually what happens is. You go, what are you at? And they're like, oh, I'm at 15 from pain, pain lands. And you're like, cool, attack for 15 with counterspell backup. And, that, and that's the end of the game. You know, I've, you've already duressed them. You know that the coast is clear and stuff. So that's how the tricks deck, uh, excuse me, the Psychotog deck works. And then there's the Oath deck. And this is the deck that I've been playing the heck out of for the last couple of days. And God, I love this deck. It's so fun. I missed, I missed this. Um, I unfortunately um, did not qualify with Oath back in the day, not because I competed with it, but because um, Mayer, Bob Mayer, I believe it was, won, um, or Maher, I think it's pronounced Mayer, he won um, a big tournament with Oath, which got it on my radar, um, and I thought, wow, that's, that's an amazing way to play Control. I just had never even, uh, honestly, the card was just completely off my radar, 100% just wasn't even thinking about it and when i saw he won i was like wow so i started using the deck and i was like wow i love this deck this is just exactly how i like to play magic um but um there were no as i recall there were no big tournaments for me to play with oath in after subsequent to his victory or at least none that i could um get to you know nothing that i could like i was uh, i was in the service at the time so you know i I, there were a lot of tournaments that I had to miss just because of my um, my uh, military obligations and stuff. So, uh, in fact, getting to the Pro Tours were, was was uh, one of them. Actually, I want to say one of them was, uh, I think I had to take leave. I think I may have had to take leave for both of them. I can't remember. But it was challenging, to say the least. And also, I was pretty broke overall because I wasn't a full, I wasn't, I was off and on between full time, so um, finances weren't necessarily the best. My rank wasn't as high either. Just a lot of reasons. But at any rate, I never got to play with this in a in a uh, serious um, event. Uh, but I did win. Um, like we would have local smaller tournaments with with prizes and stuff, and I won um, lots of prizes with this deck until. It finally rotated out or got banned or I, I can't remember what happened but basically up until the point that I could not play this deck I was playing this deck and uh, it was just it was like a money maker for me so I was doing great with this thing and um, so to be able to come back and revisit it is just super exciting now my I think my creatures that I used back then were different from the ones I spike weavers and all of them but um, because it has the ability to remove a counter to prevent all combat it has a fog ability so you can fog like three times with this thing it's a three three which means that you have time to loop through the oath loop if your other creatures have died for some reason not if they're plowed of course but if they died for any other reason and then um you can you can um, basically keep your opponent in a permanent fog uh or you can move counters off of it and you can put them like on your angel or your nishoba to finish the game off quicker I think for me, I was using Spike Weaver, Spike Feeder. Um, if you're not familiar, uh, I'll show you. Sorry the um, for the shaking. Hopefully, the shaky camera isn't too bad. I'll show you Spike Feeder. Uh, this is the one where if you remove, it has two counters, and you remove a counter to gain two life. And the other card that I was using was Phoenix. Uh, Phoenix. Shard Phoenix. So back in the day, what I was using was uh, Shard Phoenix here. It's a uh, five mana flyer, and for three mana you can return it from your graveyard to your hand during your upkeep for three red. But it sacrifices to deal two damage to each creature without flying. And the reason I was using that combination of cards is it was defensive at the time for me. Most of the creatures that were coming at me were um, uh, small. Uh, a lot of like br cheap black creatures with protection from white because people are trying to get around swords and plowshares so shard phoenix could clear those out or i could set up a fog loop but also all three of the creatures can sacrifice themselves essentially 
Um, you do need to have mana to take counters off Spike Weaver, but the other two can do it for no mana at all. And the reason that matters is because other players were playing Swords of Plowshares, and so I could loop my creatures indefinitely without necessarily, without worrying about plow. Um, that said, I don't think that that's super important or relevant now. I think it's far better to just win, uh, just try to just get what you need to win the game. And if I'm playing against like a control deck, and they're trying to play a control game with me, and so they're a, they're a Swords of Plowshares deck, um, I'm totally fine if they want to plow one of these creatures and give me six life, give me seven life, which I can then convert into cards with uh, Sylvan Library, or, or um, which just gives me plenty of time to to uh, set up a um, a long game where I'm drawing and drawing and drawing tons of cards, and maybe I, I don't have any creatures at all, and it doesn't matter at all because I'm going to kill them with a fireball or a stroke of genius. I'm either gonna I'm either gonna fireball them for lethal. I'm going to wait till the game goes long, and then I'm going to force them to draw and deck them. And so, um, or in the absolute craziest worst case, I'll Cunning Wish for my one Lightning Bolt in the sideboard, and between the Lightning Bolt and the Fire Ice, I'll set up a guy's Blessing Loop, and I'll just keep blessing those two cards in, and bolting them in the face, and then Factor Fictioning until I find it again. Bolt them in the face and factor fiction until I find it again, and just keep doing that with the scroll rack to power it up. Sylvan Library, Ivory Tower to give me life, Disrupting Scepter to keep them empty, Forbid with buyback to um, to um, ensure that that it's mathematically impossible for them to get in the game, and then you know Giant Stroke of Genius for myself. You basically can create a scenario where you almost always draw. Or, or always draw exactly what you want to draw turn after turn after turn. And with a single Disrupting Scepter running, they can never get out of it because you have Counter Lock with Stick, keeping their hand empty, Scepter being Stick. Um, basically, you keep their hand empty, you lock them out with Forbid, and you have a card drawing engine. You just keep looping that over and over, um, and that, that's the end of the game for them. It, it just takes a long time, and it's you can time out. So it's a little frustrating, but um, so it's better to kill with the creatures, but not necessary. You don't have to do that. You can you can actually kill this other way. All right. So um, can I even explain this deck? Hopefully, I don't need to for majority of folks watching, but I think it'll explain itself if we if we start playing, and you'll get a better sense of what's going on here. I have uh, been messing around with some flexible slots and, and trying some different things. I had like Frexine Furnace in here I was playing around with and I had like some Disenchant and some other stuff. Um, just kind of in and out but for the, the majority of the deck is basically what you see here. I think I didn't have Stroke of Genius or Misdirection. I had a couple other cards. Um, I think I had four factor fictions instead of three and, and then Cunning Wish was for something and I, I didn't have Cunning Wishes for a little while and so I've been kind of back and forth on it, but I'm, what I'm doing is I'm kind of honing in on what on what feels like the, the most optimal version and gives me the kind of long game preparation that no matter what kind of weird scenario I tend to find myself in, this plays out like the deck, right? This is classic Brian Weissman, the deck control, where we're going to, we're going to either, we're going to hose their mana pretty good with um, Wastelands that we can potentially even recur with the Blessings. We're going to shut off their creatures with very powerful enchantments and back that up with a bunch of removal that buys us time to get our plan on board and make sure that anything that slips through is taken care of. We're going to protect ourselves with a, a limited number but of strong, well-chosen counter effects. Four counter spells forbidden a misdirection in this case, so six counter effects. Um, and uh, we're going to use tons of card advantage. We're going to generate tons of card advantage and then finish off the game with, um, with uh, well, basically, we're going to finish off the game at our leisure once we have control of it. And then, of course, we have four Jam Day Tomes in here as well to help us out. And you're like, wait a minute, what are you talking about? I don't see any Jam Day Tomes. Well, actually, what we have is lamb, Land land Day Tomes. We have uh, uh, libraries of uh, Alexandria, Land... Uh, there we go. Library of Alex Landria. That's what we have. A.K.A. Thawing Glaciers. So, um, these guys, but essentially they're Jam Day Tomes for a very long time in the game. As you're pulling lands out with these things, if you've never seen Thawing Glaciers, you're, you're in for a treat. Um, let me just get into the games because I've been talking plenty. And I really want to showcase 
how cool this deck is. As far as as far as how good the deck is, um, I did lose twice to goblins prior to adding some additional removal to the deck that I think should have assisted in shoring up that match. Um, specifically, I didn't have the pyroclasm in here. I did not have fire ice in here. I also did not have cunning wishes in here. And cunning wish, if you're not familiar, besides being able to go and get like. Um, Destroy target enchantment with buyback. Destroy target artifact with buyback. Fog with buyback. Um, factor fiction to refill your hand. Uh, a bunch of blue blasts, red blasts, lightning bolt if you need a little removal. That's all great, and we do all those things, but also Cunning Wish goes and gets Enlightened Tutor. And so what this Cunning Wish functions as is if I have three mana, let's say I have Island, Plains, Forest, right? That's all I have. Island Plains Forest, and I go into your turn Cunning Wish, and then I grab Enlightened Tutor, the one copy of I Enlightened Tutor. Because Mystical Tutor and Vampiric are both banned, but Enlightened is not, which I actually do agree with. Uh, it shouldn't be. Um, because of Toolbox decks and um, the fact that uh, Mystical and Vamp get all the worst stuff, and, and Enlightened Tutor gets something that your opponent can disenchant. But anyway, you Cunning Wish, you grab the Enlightened Tutor, and during your upkeep, you use the white mana to cast the Enlightened Tutor, and then with the blue and the green that's remaining, you can cast your Oath of Druids. And potentially, if that's quick enough, then you're good to go. You know, you would need another turn before it triggers, and they can't kill it. But that allows you to at least Demonic Tutor, essentially, for Oath of Druids via Cunning Wish, which is really cool. The fact that you can Cunning Wish for an Oath of Druids out of your deck. Or you can Cunning Wish for, like, I don't know, any other, you know, like... Maybe you're taking a lot of damage and you have lots of cards in your hand thanks to thawing glaciers. Well, maybe you go get an ivory tower and sort of undo some of that damage or whatever. So that very cool stuff. Um, but let's get into the games. You'll, you'll, you'll see. You'll see. So anyway, um, with the last seven days, uh, what is today? Today is the 23rd. So from the 22nd, I want to say, to the 23rd. Or was it the 21st? Yeah, the 21st. I was playing around with uh, Psychotog here. It, it was doing pretty well. Um, and then yesterday, I was I started fooling with the Oath deck. Had a little, ran into some trouble there. Did pretty well. A little, I, I'm not sure why this was unresolved. This was actually, I'm sure that was a win. And then I had two losses here to Goblins, and then just win, 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 win. Uh, these are all wins. Yeah, so basically you can see between 6 and 8. I'm pretty sure this was Psychotog. I'm not 100%. Maybe this was like the initial version of the Oath deck. But yeah, it was the Oath deck actually. So 3 losses and 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 14 wins. So 14 and 3 for a format that I've, I'm familiar with because of playing back in the day, but also not because this is a slightly different one. So jumping right into it, it's, it's feeling pretty good, man. The deck feels... Nice. So let's take a look at, um, I think what I'll do is I will run through, uh, let's run through a game on the 21st and see if we can pick up a Psychotog game or two. We'll, we'll grab a couple of these here um, and just kind of see what those look like. And then we'll dive into the O stack, which is what I'm really mostly excited to showcase. Okay. So here I had to mulligan, obviously, and uh, looks like I had to mulligan again. Honestly, if I go back to Psychotog, I'm going to be putting Thawing Glaciers in it. Now that I've, uh, I had the, what I realized was that I was using fetch lands to get basic lands, like I said, and then I said to myself, why am I using fetches to get basics when I could use Thawing Glaciers to get basics, right? So when I had that sort of epiphany, um, man, deck just got so much better. So I probably go back to Psychotog and actually add um, Thawing Glaciers in, and I imagine the deck will get quite a bit stronger. But as you can see here, I, I guess my opponent's playing. It looks like Mono Blue, and you might be wondering what the heck does Mono Blue have to offer? Well, there is a land. I'm gonna Cunning Wish here, I grab a Factor Fiction. There's a land that lets you discard to untap it but doesn't untap on its own, which is a pretty huge drawback. Looks like they're blue-white control, maybe. However, that land 
uh, oh, okay, we're going to respond to this meddling mage with the factor fiction, since they know what I got. And you see how I've been holding the AK? I'm holding the AK, the accumulated knowledge, so that I can AK, so that I can factor fiction and put the first one in the graveyard for free. And then from there, I can accumulate knowledge uh, and draw two, and I don't have to cast... It's like I cast the first one off of the factor fiction, essentially. All right, so my opponent's preventing me from playing recoil. I guess they know I have that from the from the Foff. And they go for another meddling mage, since I know that I need to edict and prevent... I can't let them have two, so then they have to rename recoil. Oh, look at that. Ancestral recall. One blue, draw three. How's that Nightscape familiar? It's pretty nice, right? So now my circular logics are basically mana leaks. Except um, hard counter mana, mana leaks. All right, so at the end of my opponent's turn, we're just going to factor fiction. You see, like, the problem with not playing factor fiction in your blue deck, you see what's happening? I'm just going to take all these cards, thank you, and I'm going to Cunning Wish as well. And we'll go ahead and just grab ourselves a Gainsay. Top deck of mana leak. Like, this is just impossible for my opponent to have any... They have no business. You see what I mean? I sack the Polluted Delta. Why not just play... Um, I'm going to disrupt their mana a bit. Why not just play uh, Thawing Glaciers, right? It just makes no sense. But uh, And then here, I actually am suffering from too many cards. My opponent gives me an opportunity, though, to burn one of them to, in exchange, like, to trade it for theirs, and I'll take it. Just because otherwise, I mean, I'm flooded, so why not? Trade one for one rather than one for zero by discarding it. And there's another Factor Fiction. And now you're getting an idea of how insane this is. There used to be an uh, acronym called EOTFYL, and that acronym stands for End of Turn Factor Fiction You Lose. And if you're not sure what that's about, well, now you're kind of seeing it. So in response to their uh, counterspell, I go ahead and um, use Madness on myself by uh, sacrificing Cephalid Coliseum, discard Circular Logic, counter their uh, counter back while improving my hand, and get another Factor Fiction off. And once again, I'm going to recoil them. And so they choose to discard a Gush. From here I get to the rest of them. I'm really hoping that they play a free spell. They do. Right into my Force Spike. And at this point, my opponent is, has no permanence and is getting the rest and concedes, which makes a lot of sense. And then in game two, like, it's just hopeless, right? But in game two, um, yeah, I bring in Glooms. I think I, I, it's interesting. I, I don't... I think I cut Gloom after this, excuse me, I think I cut Gloom after this match, actually. It didn't feel necessary. It's better to just control their white cards with my blue cards than it is to control their white cards with my black cards. I can use, unless we're talking about creatures, it's, it's far better to have, like, creature removal, I think. They go for an impulse. It's a four spike opportunity, I'll take it. The gush in response, ooh, yuck. But still, it slows them down pretty, pretty heavily. But my hand is, like, no business, right? It doesn't have a lot of action. All right, so I can play Gloom here, and I do. So I'm, I'm shutting off their white. And they play Phyrexian Dreadnought. And with the trigger on the stack, they phase it out. And oops, now I realize, oh, shoot. I did not know what they were playing. It is way too early in the game for Psychotog to be relevant, by the way. And now I realize, oh, they're playing uh, Dread Panda Roberts here, or whatever it's called. Well, I've got nothing, right? My hand was actually not great at all for that, and I just, I'm dead. I mean, I could, like, I could block block and actually make the second dog big enough to live and then die, but... So I sideboarded all wrong against them. I had actually pulled out a bunch of removal, thinking they were mostly control. I re-sideboard thinking they were mostly white base control. And we go to game three. Kind of a nasty way to lose a game, but it is a, it is it does make the format pretty exciting. It's things like that can happen, but um, there are plenty of, this format's a format of, of some busted stuff, but there are more answers than there are threats. And that's the thing that makes it so um, enjoyable is that, is that like, they're, the answers are so very, very good. All right, here I'm just going to play the Tog. It's kind of bait. I don't really care what happens to it at all. If my opponent, I, w I want my opponent to go for... So they play a card that prevents me from activating it, but I wanted him to go for the 
um, Dreadnought. That way I could just recoil it and punish him pretty hard. Opponent stifles. So the Dreadnought deck runs stifle because you can stifle the Dreadnought trigger. They burn one, though, on my fetch. And because I have plenty of mana, I'm not super upset about that. They're down to three cards in hand. And if they don't save some cards up, they're not going to really be able to um, four after the cantrip effect. But if they don't save some cards up, that it's going to be hard for them to put... To, they have to get two cards in their hand in order to combo off. And then they have to deal with me, you know, interfering with them. In response to their um, impulse on my turn, I go for a Factor Fiction, which sticks. And they offer me a four and one split. I will take the four and put Accumulated Knowledge exactly where I want it to be anyway, in the graveyard. Absolutely wild. All right, so now I've got tons of mana. I attempt to Wasteland them. I get a second Stifle out of their hand. I Wasteland them again. And we just keep on trucking. Here's a good opportunity for a nightscape, and I leave um, basic land untapped so they can't like waste and then make a play. Now I've got so many answers to their uh, dreadnought. All I have to do is I'm still hitting them for two every turn. I mean, it's adding up now. There is a K for two at this point, and it only costs a single blue to play. All right, upkeep. I'm gonna fetch and see if maybe they want to throw another stifle away. Guess not. All right. Factor Fiction it is. So I go for a Foff. They gush. And foil my Factor Fiction. In response, I'm going to um, AK for two. And that's fine. Factor Fiction does not resolve. Here I get to Bounce Curse Totem, however. They go for a foil. I'm going to Cunning Wish in response. Hopefully you know what's coming. It's going to be a gain save for a single blue. Bounce that, and... Oh, you're at 10 life? Well, now you're dead. So, I start pumping Psychic Hog, and they know what's coming, and they scoop. So, they have no white untapped. Unless they're playing on summon, there's no surviving this. So, there was one pump on the stack, so it was going to be a 2-2. Two, two. These two cards make it a 3-3. Three, three. These two make it a 4-4, four, four, then a 5-5, five, five, then a 6-6. Six, six. Discard this. It's a 7-7. Seven, seven. And discard... Exile these two. 8-8. Eight, eight. Discard this as a 9-9. Nine, nine. 10 10 11 11 and then exile these two 12 12 so i could have made it a 12 12 or potentially even bigger if i wastelanded my own land um but i could have hit him for basically 13 right there that's bit that's that's how the psychic hog deck plays out I, it doesn't and it's fun and it's good but it just doesn't throw me as much as the as the oath deck so i want to start with uh i guess i guess we could start with the initial loss uh, but you can see, like, it took an hour of tuning the deck after this loss to actually get going. And then and then from there, we're on a win streak. I'll run through the goblin losses. So, and then you can see a goblin win. So I think I'm just going to skip. I'll skip the initial one because this was, like, pre... This was the first time I put the oath deck together. And I made a bunch of adjustments. Um, I was actually trying to run accumulated knowledge and realized that what I needed to run was um, impulse. Because in Psychotog, you're trying to generate a massive cards and in um, oath you're trying to get to a specific card oath of druids so it's more important to dig deep early than it is to to dig a, a well i guess late all right so all right so this is um against nick Kutupri and um, opponent elvish spirit guides out of uh survival of the fittest you can see i was playing a I was playing a Miser's copy of Disenchant, and I just happened to have it here, so um, I just decide I'm going to go with Oath, and I'll let them have the survival, and we'll see, like, what can they actually do, right? So they go and get a Basking Root Walla, pitching the Basking Root Walla to go get a Basking Root Walla, pitching that to get another one, and now with Cradle running, which I, I didn't destroy thinking it wasn't going to be that big of a deal, look at how insane Survival of the Fittest is in that green deck. And... He finishes off with a morph. And this morph, if you're not familiar, there's a green creature that for two mana, you, you morph it face down, and then for two mana, it's Nantuko something or other. You turn it face up and destroy an artifact or enchantment. So for my turn, I mill into, I mill through a bunch of stuff, and I hit um, Phantom Neshoba. I waste my opponent's cradle. They only have one card in hand. And rather than dis disenchanting the survival, I'm going to set on Counterspell because I'm concerned about whatever... Yeah, Nintuko Vigilante. So no more... I don't get multiple Oath triggers. But it might not matter. The damage is done, right? End of their turn, I'm going to Impulse. I'll grab a Glaciers. We'll get started with... Gla Unfortunately, I, I then drew a Glaciers. 
So here I send in for seven. My opponent blocks with everything. My Neshoba will become a six six. All the damage is done at once. Then it's all prevented and it just becomes a six six. And uh, meanwhile, all their stuff would die. I would life link and trample. My opponent just concedes. This one card just houses their whole their whole game plan from here. There's very little they can do. And then with the counter spell, like they're gonna go get something, I'm gonna counter it, and then on my turn I'm gonna seal cleansing away the survival. Never actually used it, which was which was one of the keys that set me into thinking like, do I actually necessarily need this? Alright, game two against this opponent. I'm still like figuring out how the format works. You can see I still have a spike feeder in the deck. Probably don't need that. You know, like I said, I was kind of building my original deck and then <clears throat> I've been improving on it. And my opponent gets an early morph, and uh, fortunately I have fire ice. So all I need to do, of course, is just draw red, and then I can kill that morph, which we already know what it is. And then that'll allow me to get Oath of Druids. Not, do not doing too much else. The wall blossoms and stuff doesn't bother me at all. I'm going to make a misplay in this game. A small misplay, but it's important, and I'll show you what it is. All right, that can tutor up red. Thawing Glaciers can get all of my color of mana. There, that's the misplay. Did you catch it? I needed to counterspell the root wall of for time. Dying with counter magic in your hand, just not, not, it means you, you screwed up somehow. Not only would it have um, bought me three points of damage here, stopped me from taking three points, I end up icing in desperation here because I have a plow and I can plow that thing now. But um, the cradle would have been powered down as well. It would have bought me all kinds of time. So I'd have three more life and so forth. So I kill this and I realize it doesn't matter. I can play out the druids and then die. My opponent has guys cradle and two root wallers, and they're gonna. I'm gonna take one and go to seven, then three, six, seven. I'm dead. All because I didn't counterspell that root wall. So, oops. Stupid tax paid. So we go on to game three. And uh, any hand with an early oath is a good hand generally. My opponent's mulliganing to four. Not looking good for them. Right, and then for me, of course, I have the oath, but I'm gonna wait. If I can spend time building up my hand, and as opposed to running oath out until there's actually something to trigger it, well, that's great. So that's what I'm gonna try to do. So I go an impulse, find myself a Sylvan, which I can use as bait. So let's see if I can run that out, and then um, oh, well, actually, I, I guess I chose the other route. I, I guess I chose to play the oath. I think I should have baited with the Sylvan, but I mean, this is okay, but it's not great. It's not as good as... So I'm going to Impulse again, looking for... And uh, I don't know if you caught that, but there was a, some cards in there that don't necessarily belong. Um, again, early versions. Opponent has a Naturalize for my Sylvan, so it does end up functioning as bait. I do have this Impulse here, and you can see why Impulse is so much more important. Although at this point, I'm in Factor Fiction territory, so... Ugh. The morph. All right, so I'm not in factor fiction territory. Now you can see why impulse is much more important than accumulated knowledge. And boom, there it is. As if it was a blue instant speed demonic tutor, right? Super lucky that it found it, but you know I got to dig really deep to, to get to it. All right, I'm taking a risk here, but um, I mean it's, it's up to top decking for them. They top deck a Kai's cradle. Jeez, the beatings. At deck, mulligan to four, and I'm beating me up, right? Just gnarly. Um, this version, uh, so I get a Spike Weaver, which is, a you know, three fogs. It's going to buy me a ton of time. And, of course, I've got Forbid, as well as the Factor Fiction there. Yeah, sure, pump away. Um, but, anyway, this version did not have Pyroclasm and some of the other removal. And you can see how much pressure you can get put on and why it's important, I think, to have that removal. I'm going to go ahead and grab myself some red or white. Anyway, I'm, I'm grabbing myself some. I didn't, I didn't catch which one I pulled out, but it, it doesn't matter. We get to Oath again. We get the Neshoba. My opponent scoops it up. All right. So that was um, that was uh, what was it? Played 840. Okay. So then on to this game against Apathetic 89. Mm. I am struggling to uh, get through this video because I've injured myself pretty severely and um, 
my pain is uh, increasing as I'm making the video. Uh, if I, I'm gonna have to adjust myself. So if I'm, I'm not in the camera, it's kind of why. Hopefully, it doesn't mess up the sound too bad. Playing goblins, and I get a turn two oath. They have to sacrifice their mog fanatic. They don't get a first turn. Um, they don't get a first turn lackey, which probably would have completely changed this game. And now we get to play the game that I want to play. One of the cards. I don't recall, I think in Tempest, uh, Price of Progress is, is a legal card. And the other reason for running a Thawing Glaciers based mana base is that um, is that I don't want to play too many non-basics and um, set myself up for dying to Price of Progress. So uh, I'm, I'm perfectly happy just playing, using my, uh, my uh, card drawing engine here to pull ahead and I'm not actually sure what my opponent's playing towards, but my best guess was Price of Progress. It would make sense to me, but who knows. I grabbed white there just because I didn't have access to the color. Um, obviously, I don't have a white card in my hand, but it's just thinking ahead. Uh, it's typically better to play to the cards. So it might have been better to play. I got to lay back because of this injury. It's just hurting me so bad. So now that I have um, two glaciers running, I can have one in play. <coughs> excuse me at all times and uh what i need to do now probably is either get red for fire ice or blue for the second counter spell to me it makes far more sense to get another blue here first i have no pressing need for casting fire ice and just keeping myself protected is super important and you can see my opponents having to discard goblins while uh while i just get glacier after glacier here and we're just we're just crushing the interaction between glaciers and oath is just so absolutely fantastic um, because oath does cause these game stalls and glaciers loves a game stall so they're like this is i don't recall these two cards like really ever being used together in the same deck and so this this kind of innovation for me maybe they were but i don't recall it and so for me this was just um feels so good to have realized like to have that aha moment and stuck the glaciers in and real t so that I would because I was looking for something to do during the game stalls and I mean look at how far ahead I am it's just so lovely all right so now I could hard cast in the show but we're, we're gonna wait I'll be patient if my opponent doesn't do anything whatsoever and I did I put all this mana into play and I'm still not really vulnerable to price of progress if my opponent cast one I would wasteland my own Thawing Glaciers in response, and I would take two, right? Okay, here we go. So now I can just throw away the extra Glaciers. I'm done. They've melted. We got all seven lands. Opponent's going to Wasteland my Wasteland. Sure, I'll, I'll cast Factor Fiction in response. You can see I was running Sterling Grove at the time. Um, I since have replaced those with Cunning Wish, which just makes more sense to me. Because I can Cunning Wish for Oath of Druids just like I could Sterling Grove for Oath of Druids. Except Cunning Wish is a far more valuable and flexible card. And the reason I was running Seal of Cleansing, incidentally, was because I was running Sterling Grove and it gave me a disenchant that I could tutor for. Now with Scroll Rack in play, any extra Thawing Glaciers I draw give me the ability to do... You know how you can do like a Brainstorm Fetch Land? Well, I can now do that with Thawing Glaciers even if I'm getting nothing. I can just do that forever. Opponent kind of realizing that like I'm just getting too many cards is going for a big turn so they can get a big win. And I'm just going to stop the most important cards. Mana generators, uh, big damage guys. I'm going to go and ice their uh, goblin lackey and just take two damage here because I didn't have red untapped to burn it. But that's fine. And now I get to oath. And yeah, well, first things first. Let's put the Neshoba back. The guy is blessing the, the thawing glaciers. We'll uh, scroll rack those specifically away and then make sure that we hit the um, blessing so that we can shuffle uh, by, by stacking them in the right order. And then we'll trigger the other one and grab ourselves. I still was running the silly spike feeder. I just don't think it. You can also see I was running Teferi's Moat main deck, which obviously is a house against mono red. Um, Teferi's Moat, if you're not familiar, you name a color and creatures of the chosen color without flying can't attack you. So this is basically moat for that entire deck. And my opponent concedes, but I mean, it was already over. And the moat was just win more, which is why I ultimately ended up cutting it. All right. 
Uh, and then of course we sideboard. I have to mulligan and decide I'm going to keep this hand here. Not a great hand against goblins, but it has some early interaction. Has a thawing G's. And my opponent leads off with a pile driver. I cannot blue elemental blast that. Oh, once it's in play, I can only get it on the way down. So he swings in, hits me for one. Um, but misses a land drop. Has a port, but misses a land drop crucially, which I can go get red. So while I can't blue elemental blast that thing, I can just kill it. And because I have a blue blast in my hand, I'm just going to play a basic island here and play it safe. And we'll start thawing in a second. Like a G. A thawing G. All right, there we go. I'm going to get that scroll rack on board soon enough, but I want to make sure I have my blue blast up unless my opponent ports my land and makes a play. But, you know, what play can they make that's pr particularly good in, under those conditions? In response to port, I just activate thawing glaciers. Sure. All right, and then top deck another glaciers. Lovely, lovely stuff. You can see how insane this card is. What a powerful land, right? Imagine trying to play this card in modern in modern day magic. Like imagine trying to play it in Commander. And how like sexy it looks, but how impossible it would be because the formats are just so insanely fast. They're just blazingly fast. No games last long enough for you to even have time to thaw a glacier. Um, it's like blinking you're dead, right? Magic is so much it was to me it was so much more interesting and interactive in the past. Here, I'm going to burn a hard counter because a counter is a counter, but spending two mana on one now allows me to spend one on one later, and I had the mana now, so let's do that. And at this point, my opponent gives up. Obviously, like, they're ultra mega super dead, right? There's no, there's nothing they're going to do ever in this game whatsoever. And I've got Thawing Glaciers plus Skull Rack running too. It's just completely hopeless. So that was against, uh, that was at 9.03. Let's look for the next game. Uh, this one. Kanafani. And this was a best of three. Opponent did win a game. But don't worry, the goblins will come back and get their revenge on behalf of that opponent from another opponent later. Opponent leads off with the duress, takes an ivory tower. A very interesting choice when you're the discard deck. Once again, I drew that Sterling Grove instead of... Um, instead of my Cunning Wish, which it should have been. And because I didn't play City of Brass on turn one, my opponent, of course, takes the plow that they know of using Cabal Therapy and plays an Elder and does not flashback Cabal Therapy. Such an interesting choice. So I'm going to go ahead and play a Scepter here. I could have played a Sterling Grove, of course, but I'm checking for a uh, Disenchant effect. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and play it now. Since it seems like they don't have one. And my opponent's got a lot of pressure, so they're in for four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Uh, I guess four, and then we find out why six is afraid of seven, because seven, eight, nine, something like that. Anyway, I'm going to go ahead and do the tutor, and then what I decided to do is I grab Teferi's moat rather than oath, and I moat green. So in this case, moat was pretty useful. The, the Silt Sterling Grove moat thing was pretty useful. Opponent flashes back therapy now, finally. Um, well, I don't have anything in hand. And then top decks Phyrexian Rager into Phyrexian Rager. And as I said, I have nothing in hand. You can see I was testing aura shards. Uh, ultimately cut it, I think, right after this game. And bashes me. And now you see, you get a better idea of why I'm not playing Teferi's Moat either. Looked good, right? It looked really strong, but... It helped me win a game I was already winning and didn't save me in a game I was losing. So not a good sign. All right. Game two, though, against this opponent. Um, looks like I'm going to get the win, and then they're going to win game three, I, I assume, or maybe I'll win game three. But uh, we did we did have a best of three, so we know that I'm in it here. Opponent leads off with Cabal Therapy naming Sterling Grove. Such an interesting choice there. Um, so I go ahead and play a Sylvan Library. They Therapy, and this time they name Counterspell. But I've already got Sylvan down. Let's go ahead and... Uh, because I have Thawing Glaciers Sylvan, I don't pay life just to grab some random lands when I can Thaw and um, pay life for real spells. When it plays a Deed, so I will be paying life this turn. So during Upkeep, let's get past that. Let's Thaw during Upkeep and then Sylvan. And then let's pay some life. 
and get a land down. Wasteland my opponent and pass. Okay. Which make it harder for them to deed, but I mean, if they want to deed for two here, which they decide wisely, I think, they've got to kill the Sylvan. But now I'm just going to slam Oath, and we'll see what they do about that. So they duress me, uh, taking Factor Fiction, which sucks. Cabal Therapy way at double sorts to Plowshares, which really sucks. But I already have Oath in play, so they're going to need another deed or a Disenchant effect uh, before they can put any threats on the board. And also, if you've noticed, I've severely hurt them with the Wasteland because uh, they don't have any green. And not only have I hurt them with the Wasteland, but um, I'm able to... Uh, uh, it's not hurting me at all because of Thawing Glaciers, right? I, I'm destroying my lands to kill their lands while in subsequent turns just pulling more and more lands out of my deck. I impulse into a Factor Fiction there. Opponent doesn't have any discards, so now I get to Foff. And he can Foff himself. Uh, I grab Impulse Scepter and uh, Impulse Stick and uh, City of Brass. I go ahead and play the stick and I'm going to take a turn off of Thawing just to start getting into their hand. They're already down to two cards. They take a Bailoth out of their hand and my opponent concedes. I mean at this point if they play a Forest and cast a spell I'm going to take the last card out of their hand unless that spell is like naturalized. And then from there, you know, they're totally toast. Um, but if it was naturalized they would have killed an Oath. Like, their best play there would have been to top deck a forest and be holding a, pr a, a deed, in which case they could go forest deed. And then I stick the last card out of their hand, go back to scepturing and impulsing my way into even more card draw. But there's no way they're in that game. All right, great hand here. My opponent has to mulligan crazy hard to four cards. All right, we're going to lead off on glaciers. I could set up for a counter spell, but there's very little I'm afraid of that I can't handle with a plow and a, and a counter a turn later. I'm not going to just insta-die. Um, you know, if they had, like, Dark Ritual Hypnotic Spectre, I could go Land Swords. So, while on the other hand, Frexian Rager, it'd be nice to counter, maybe, but I don't really want to counter it. Even though it draws a card, like, do I really want to counter that? I'm not sure that I do. Counter spells are very valuable. We just don't have that many in this deck. I end up overdrawing, so I throw away the other Glaciers, thinking that as long as they don't Wasteland it, it's fine. They play a Wall of Blossoms. Like... Yeah, eventually I, I'll deal with this, but actually them having that in play is just um, a trigger for Oath, right? So the, I'm thinking, let's just let's just dig our way into an Oath of Druids. All right, which is exactly what happens. So I'm gonna I'm gonna go for it. Let's see if they've got an answer here. If they do, I'll thaw, and then you know I'll be I'm only taking two per turn. If they can't answer the Oath, then I win. They do get a deed out. Okay, that's fine. I'll thaw. And uh, I put Oath on the stack. I can't believe they let this resolve. They let it resolve. He says he just wants to see what I have. He says, is it Terravore? That's not a crazy idea. That's a creature that's three mana and gets power and toughness equal to the number of lands in your graveyard, plus one on the toughness. Uh, but no, I'm playing um, where we're going. Uh, we have no need for Terravores. I get a Phantom Neshoba, and he's he's rather sad because he was hoping to deed away my Terravore, um, which is what he expected me to have. I think, I guess that's what the Oath decks are doing these days. Um, but, you know, it's it's me, and I'm, I'm like not building a net deck, I'm building a me deck. So instead we got Phantom Neshobas coming in and just knocking the wind out of them, right? Opponent does sack his Elder here. I'm, I'm gonna two to that, four to that, and one point of trample and gain seven life, and then my guy becomes a six six. But I can move a Spike Feeder token and make him a 7-7 seven, seven or an 8-8 eight, eight if I want. When it gets to Oath, uh, but with Oath on the stack, I actually just eat my Spike... My, I just eat my Speeder tokens. I'm going to just call it what I always call it, by the way. I'm going to go ahead and counter his dress. Uh, spike Feeder, a um, good buddy of mine named Mike from... Uh, a friend of mine from Savannah, Georgia, uh, used to call it Speeder, and it stuck. So that's what I tend to call it. If I'm not paying attention. So if you hear me say speeder, I mean spike feeder. But anyway, my speeder's dead. I do it in response to the oath is interesting. If you're not familiar, not only does it have an activated trigger, but uh, uh, not only does it have a trigger, but it also checks on resolution. So if if oath goes on the stack and then you can somehow equalize the creature count or otherwise get it in a situation where it shouldn't be ha uh, resolving, then oath will not resolve if you notice by the way we're just i'm just doing phantom neshoba beats and finally my opponent gets seven mana here but while i was doing all the neshoba beats so he can you know deed for seven right clearing the oath and the, and the neshoba but while i was doing that 
I was also uh, factor fictioning, setting up her cards. Boy, do I w wish that was a cunning wish here. I said that to myself so many times, eventually I figured it out. I go ahead and just take a risk and let them name whatever they want with therapy, and they, they miss. And then he goes for a drain turn it, and uh, I'm pump fake a counter. I was thinking whether or not I wanted to do it, but the truth is I'm just going to Sterling Grove for an oath. I'm going to have so much life here. So I start the counter and change my mind. My opponent says, good game. I have to go to a meeting. Let's play again. And um, I definitely welcome it. So, yeah, thank you, um, opponent, for a good game. That was at, uh, let's see, eight, 930. And then after that, we've got this one, 1054. And uh, we'll run through this. All right. Against Umabashi. Hopefully I'm pronouncing that remotely correctly. All right, so I lead off with an island. I mean, I, I don't have a great hand here, but boy, if it, it's going to pop off if I get a green, and I sure do. Let's go straight for Sylvan Library. My opponent says, hi, good luck, have fun, practice okay. I said, you know, absolutely. All right, so he's going to tap down my duel, basically. And once again, I can pay life to keep the um, actual... I, I, pay, I pay life to keep the Thawing Glaciers and the Impulse while letting the, uh, while letting the uh, basic land go during my upkeep they pour uh, you've already seen this story you know how this goes port me with the thawing glaciers out sure now i get to look at three new cards again and uh i decide to set it up this way i'm just going to impulse is the plan we'll get past those and i'll pay some life here at some point when it's playing what appears to be mono black so i impulse into wasteland seems good here Port me. I could factor fiction, but I don't want to discard. I'm okay. You can see I was playing around with Felwar Stones here. I don't wasteland them here. I, I play a stick. And I believe I really screw the pooch this game. Opponent takes my uh, Swords to Plowshares out. I let him in the game, uh, which is never good. Alright. Play the Glaciers here. I'm going to Scepter them. Get a Contagion. They're down to three cards in hand. I'm at three cards in hand. Got a wasteland, got a plow, got an impulse. Feeling pretty good about things. Uh, I'm not sure what happens here. Are we going to bug out? Oh no, I think he's casting Skeletal Scrying. Yeah, he's casting Skeletal Scrying. So go ahead and waste him after the Scrying so he has less mana to work with post Scry. Post Scrying. Um, then my opponent plays Zombie Infestation. Uh, discards a nether spirit to it and plays contamination. I plow, but I actually have no way to get out from under this lock, so I, I'm going to let it ride for a little while just to see how it goes. Take the last card out of their hand. They're never going to. They're never going to zombie infestation again. They get the nether, but they set up their triggers correctly. Nether spirit uh, pops out and then gets sacked to contamination. So I'm trying to think like maybe I can exhaust their patience and get them to stop with what they're doing so i'm just going to set my hand up contamination causes all the lands to produce black so that i make them discard a card and what i'm going to do is i'm going to stop i'm not going to punish you the viewer we go through this loop again and again and again where for contamination they draw a card and then i take it before they can make a zombie and that happens again and again and again and again and then finally i r stick them in response they uh the card they drew is skeletal scrying and they scry up and then they make uh, they scry like three or four uh, for three or four and then they make a zombie and from there they have a threat that will actually stick and so they continue to pay for contamination with nether spirit and hit me with a zombie until i'm dead i i realize that that's what's going to happen and i have literally zero ways out of this lock there's no because this this only makes black and these lands all tap for black and there's no i don't have like mox diamond or something in my deck to get out of it so i just move on to game two So really gnarly, um, but um, because I spent a lot of time like uh, kind of like waiting to see if they were going to actually be able to kill me, if they were going to have the patience to do it and find a solution to it, once they demonstrated that they had the threat, I went ahead and conceded. So here you can see I'm getting duressed early, and unfortunately port and city is not, not the best interaction, but here I've top decked uh, compost, which is really nice. So we'll get that down. Anyway... But because of all that, my opponent um, used up a lot of time on the clock. 
and they're down to 12 minutes so um you know i don't try to win with the clock victory but i will take a clock victory if you can't actually kill me you know when it goes for another spirit here and uh, in response i'm actually going to counter spell it it's like what the heck well that triggers compost so i draw a card right and then on my turn i can gaia's blessing that thing away and i put some other cards that are just junk into their deck play a uh, thawing glaciers and pass my opponent plays a dystopia and with zombie infestation dystopia is going to make me sack the compost which is pretty disappointing uh but i at least got a card off of the uh, nether spirit there so I scroll rack and maybe that last play was a little too cute i'm going to get rid of some of the cards i don't want and keep factor fiction ultimately um i scroll rack for three but i put Foff on top so that i draw it and there we go away goes the compost <clears throat> So now I've got double factor fiction counterspell. So feeling pretty good with the thawing glaciers and the scroll rack running, but not great. I don't love the dystopia. I don't love the zombie infestation at all. Uh, this could, um, if I if they're able to get the counterspell out of my hand, they could set up and lock me out. And then there's a duress, so I could have scroll racked that to hide it. But I decide what I I really want to cast factor fiction, so I'm going to go for that instead. So opponent setting up this way. And I finally take the uh, three pile. And then now I scroll rack to hide my cards. So this way they have to guess on the Cabal Therapy. They don't know what to name. Unfortunately, I find two Oath of Druids. And guess what they're more than likely going to say? I thought it was going to be Oath of Druids. Instead, they say Seal of Cleansing. Phew, dodged a bullet. Um, on the other hand, if they play um, Contagion here, uh, I could be in big trouble. They are down to only two cards in hand, though, so I guess they would need three cards to be able to lock me out, so... They could have discarded two cards and flashback Cabal Therapy and took the Oath of Druids out of my hand, but they would have been trading two of their cards for two of my cards. I'm not even sure that that's the greatest of plays that they could be making. So they do make a zombie. They just decided not to trade it for an Oath. Very interesting. But I get it. They have Dystopia, so I guess they're not super worried about the Oath. And remember, I do have a counter spell that I can pick up here. Uh, it's just a moment. Alright, so they flash that back. I'm once again going to change my hands so that they don't know what to name for their Cabal Therapy. Or not a Counterspell, a Disenchant. That's right. And then I'm going to go ahead and Disenchant in response. Let's take out the Dystopia. And then let's take out the uh, Zombie Infestation so there's no chance. And you can see I at the time I had sideboard, sideboard Disenchants. And from here... Uh, they get they get to name nothing, and they have only one card in hand. Once again, Scroll Rack just doing some serious work, and about to do some really good work with the uh, glaciers, right? All right, so I'm going to grab, turn these lands into uh, something more useful. Thaw off, thaw off the uh, cards I don't want, and then impulse into what I do want. Set myself up with a factor fiction. Uh, draw a speeder and pass for the turn. Playing another glaciers, of course. Because that's what we do around here. Uh, Alright, so the end of my opponent's turn. Now we can finally pretty comfortably factor fiction. And I try not to factor fiction when I know the top card of my library is actually a bunch of good cards that I've scroll racked there. Because I don't want to factor fiction away good cards. Opponent packs in response here. They're actually really, if you notice, their time is just really, they're five minutes behind me. Um, so I'm not really sure why, but they packed into a zombie infestation. I'm not even remotely concerned about the uh, infestation of zombies around here. Let's go ahead and just play another Thawing Glaciers and just keep keep the uh, Thawing G's running. All right, so they get the zombie infestation. Now they've got three cards in hand. I've got a counter. And, of course, I have Oath as well as the glacier scroll rack thing going so let's let's set ourselves up just a little bit better clean clean this hand up and uh we're gonna go ahead and try to force them to use it now or never they choose to use it now discarding another spirit and another card and then i'm gonna impulse through all this stuff grab the uh, plow for the nether spirit i was planning to shuffle first but uh, when i saw the nether spirit i figured i, I might want to plow that okay now let's get uh oath of druids down and pass. Of course, I drew an extra plow, which I don't really need. 
but that's fine. All right, so they're going to hit me. Taking me to four. I'm going to Cabal Therapy me. I'm going to scroll rack again. Here, I don't know why I kept Counterspell. Like, what are they most likely to name, right? I'll go ahead and plow the uh, Nether Spirit. Well, they're most likely to name Counterspell, frankly. Oh, and they reanimate my Neshoba. Oh, no. All right, well, we're going to shuffle. All right, so during upkeep, I get to Oath. I'll Oath into... They have no cards in hand now at this point. Into a Spike Weaver, so we get a Fog. And then I get to scroll rack away my whole hand. Don't, don't like it. Finding a Plow and Factor Fiction. Very, very nice. Draw a card for the turn. Pass. And opponent uh, could swing in. It's not going to do too much. When it's down to two minutes, they really need to hurry. And they only have one card in hand, so there shouldn't be like a lot of thinking going on here. So obviously, they swing in. I remove a counter fog. Um, I don't know why we didn't actually see the attack here, but whatever. No basic lands. I think we're getting into bug game territory. Um, um, but bottom line is, is uh, yeah. Well, maybe we're not. Maybe I, oh, maybe I just did that so that I could shuffle and pick up a card for my uh, for my scroll rack. I suppose that makes sense. Then I play Thawing Glaciers and then I put these basic lands back into my deck. I suppose that makes sense. But anyway, what's going to happen is I'm going to keep running through Spike Feeder, and like Weaver is going to find a Spike Feeder. Spike Feeder is going to move a counter over to Weaver or two counters over, and I'm just going to have infinite fogs. The first time I loop through, so I move two counters over to Weaver and I burn one of them. And then I run, I run through my deck, hit Trigger Guy's Blessing. I hit no, no creature, but that shuffles it back in. Then I remove the second counter from the Spike Feeder. And then I oath into him again, and I move two counters over, and we have just an infinite fog machine. And uh, with that, my opponent gives up, and of course, of course, eventually I factor fiction my way to victory. But the main thing is, they're down to two minutes, right? So they were like, by that point, they were like six minutes behind me, and there's no possible way that, way that they can win. First of all, there's no way that they can win that game, and then there's definitely no way that they can win. Uh, uh, a subsequent game with like just a couple minutes left so moving on to the next opponent here you do have to play like in a timely manner um online you can see i was trying out a accumulated knowledges against this opponent and i think it worked out okay but i still and i was trying here i switched out the teferi's moats for the um collective restraints here thinking that that would be better opponent um nails me with an oath taking oath this is like what a horrible start to a game plays an elder so this, this opponent's playing the rock flashes back the elder and gets to take whatever they want from me i think they take what double factor fictions just so brutal well meanwhile i, I get to draw and I, why would i even keep this hand this is such an embarrassing game like this just seems horrible i guess i kept it because i had oath just awful anyway here you can see sterling grove actually doing work in the sense that it's better than cunning wish would have been in this exact scenario of me keeping a terrible hand. Or at least it would have been if they hadn't had a pernicious deed there. Um, fortunately, AK comes to the rescue. I, I actually get a card, hit a land here. Opponent finds a Dust Bowl. Oh my gosh, it's just so brutal. Bulls away my white mana. I'll draw two and I manage to land a, a land <laughs> onto the board. Hits me again. Dust Bulls me again. Okay, let's get another basic and find a scroll rack. Opponent hits me for two. Has four cards in hand. Six mana. There's another Phyrexian Rager. Throws themselves a Rager. All right, so I'm going to um, scroll rack here. Now here the Collective Restraint actually seems like it'll be a little bit useful. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and play it here. And... Uh, my opponent cycles a crows and tuskers, so they're going to go get a land and draw a card. All right, so they've got six mana, but they choose to play Wall of Blossoms rather than attack for four, and then they sacrifice Diabolic Edict. They edict it, uh, Diabolic Intent it away in order to tutor up a, a pernicious deed. 
So I'm going to play Thawing Glaciers and just pass. Opponent has to spend six mana here to attack. But um, I can... That means they're not deeding. I can um, go ahead and uh, scroll rack here. And then do the, the Glacier's Rack trick. Let's go get some white. And from here, I'm going to actually play the speeder. It's actually going to come in handy for me. And I'm thinking about, do I want to Wasteland them or do I want to Scroll Rack? And I think I decide I want to Scroll Rack. Or if they pay for the village there, they actually go for play some removal. So I'm going to gain four life. They play a Wall of Roots. An Elder... It's a wild to me that they're not attacking. They're buying, They're giving me so much time. And then they dust bowl targeting my wasteland, which allows me to then wasteland their treetop village in response. Fantastic. All right, let's um, adjust my hand once more. Keeping one plow in hand, one on top, and there's down comes the glaciers again. Now I've got counter magic and a factor fiction. So you can see the collective restraint is actually doing a good job here. Uh, at least... Uh, it's doing a job. I don't know if it's doing a good job. And then my opponent blows oh, up the board. Phenomenal. Phenomenal for me. Goes for a deranged hermit to finish me off. And, um, well, I've got a counter spell for that. Lovely. If they don't have uh, uh, another mass threat like hermit, they're going to be in a lot of trouble. They go for a wasteland, so I'm going to go ahead and thaw. Grabbing another island. And they wasted my my Yavamea Coast and not my Thawing Glaciers. At the end of their turn, I'm going to Factor Fiction. You can see I had like, um, I did have Mox Diamond in here because I, I felt like it made a lot of sense with Glaciers, but later I cut it because I felt like, well, it doesn't make a lot of sense without Glaciers, and y you don't always have Glaciers, um, although, you know, quite often we do. And at that point, with the big Factor Fiction refueling my hand and Glaciers running, despite the damage my opponent did, they went ahead and conceded. So you can see me playing with different ideas here throughout the course of this. All right, I have to take a mulligan, but now I've got um, uh, a pretty solid hand. And my opponent dresses away a counter right into a counter magic, which is pretty awesome. All right, I'm taking a risk because obviously if they have like Phyrexian Arena, oh, excuse me, if they have Phyrexian Arena, I get punished here pretty hard. But otherwise I'm okay. And I think it makes more sense to uh, improve my mana here. So I'm gonna get a second island first. And then we'll go ahead and start getting uh, other colors of mana. More than likely, I, I would imagine planes first. But I drew a stick. And we'll just sit back and wait wait on that. Opponent um, applies the counter to their wall of roots and goes for a hermit. Once again, I have a counter spell thanks to that rip despite off of the duress. Okay, so I get a planes, because I'm going to play to the cards that are in my hand, not the cards that I wish were in my hand. That's why I don't get green. And, of course, immediately I draw, you know, a green card. But now, I, now that I have my green card, <laughs> I, uh, I've got Factor Fiction mana up. So my opponent plays a Bayloth. And, once again, E-O-T-F-O-F-Y-L. Look at that. Now, if you don't know how this works, the interaction between Factor Fiction and Gaia's Blessing is that these cards that I don't select will go into the graveyard from my library directly, and as a result, the Gaia's Blessing clause will trigger and reshuffle all my stuff back in. So if I choose the two pile, Gaia's Blessing will actually shuffle all of the cards back in. Or I could take the three pile with the counterspell in it. I mean, if my opponent's going to give me th three cards, including the counterspell, I'm taking it. I'll go ahead and waste that village. Plow that Bayloth. My opponent's axe in response. Makes a lot of sense. Why go to get exiled for full life? And you can sack it for full life and potentially recur it later. But then they draw and they just really have nothing. And uh, they know I have a counter spell. Plus I've got glaciers running. I'm gonna about to go get my green mana. And things are going to really pop off. And of course I have this stick. And I'm going to start hitting them with. And that is it. Alright, so now the goblins... And here's where you'll see me refine um, the deck. You can see, remember, here I'm going to lose these two matches, and then I'll play Goblins and win uh, the exact same opponent. And uh, I don't necessarily know. I, so, again, I don't know what my opponent's playing. I'm going to lead off with Thawing Glaciers and then potentially thaw into a plow and then into planes, and then I've got some defenses against whatever my opponent's doing, and I bought myself some time so I can get some card advantage. 
and uh, are we going to proceed? I'm not exactly sure what's happening here. Is there some way I can push this thing? Ah, that's what happened, yeah. So my opponent leads off with a wasteland. And unfortunately, my hand is a little bit fragile. And then... Yeah, they play land. I do have a counter magic. I burn it on a pile driver. Too aggressive. Should not have done that. I just cycle there. Here, I've still got these crappy AKs. I want to place a matron. And... Uh, Gets a pile driver down. Matron, of course, finds ringleader, which is four mana play. So I, I tried wasting him to stall. I try factor fictioning. But now you can just see how bad my opponent's running main deck disenchants, ringleader, all this stuff. Yeah, you can see this is just no, no good. Pretty hopeless. Moving in game two, and um, I should have a better opportunity to uh, do well here, given that I given that I have four blue blasts, right? Uh, but I do have to mulligan, so I'll lead off with glaciers once again. And my opponent has... Oop, first turn lackey. Shit. I'm a little bit behind. I run a land out. They hit me with lackey, lackey into ringleader, ringleader into lackey. Uh, in fact, pile driver, siege gang, lackey. I get oath down... And they run out Pile Driver Siege Gang. Like, wh what even is this? How much mana have they spent for free? I get a, a Spike Weaver, and at this point, my opponent cycles and kills it, cycles the Jump Home Incinerator and kills it. But this is, this is like turn three, right? And they, they've got seven, let's see, five, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So they, for one red, my opponent got four Black Lotuses. They got f 12 mana for free for one red and drew three cards. So they got to, uh, or more, right? So they got to Tidings themselves, or Ancestral Recall themselves, plus play four Black Lotuses, plus leave all this in play. And all it cost them to do all that was a single red mana. This is dumb to me. Uh, it seems like a huge oversight on the, on the, on the, um, like, that, that level of just insanity seems like a huge oversight on the ban list. So I jump into another one, and the exact same thing happens. And uh, they first turn Lackey, and I just concede. And I'm like, okay, I've got to add removal. So I went in and add Fire Ice. I add Pyroclasm. It's not a lot, but sometimes, a little, sometimes you just need to tweak the dial a little. And here we get a third match against the same opponent. Um... And uh, I don't know why I mulliganed here. Ugh, this is horrible. But my opponent had changed decks, and the rest is an AK out of my hand. So what's going on here? I thought he was playing goblins because he just raffle stopped me twice with the goblins. Uh, but he's not. And again, I'm still running the AKs. It's going to turn out to be helpful here, but um, over impulse perhaps. But uh, yeah, um... Not exactly like a good start to a magic game for me. The only saving grace is my opponent also mulliganed a few times. Had I known what they were playing, had I known, I would have kept my initial hand, which was a bunch of lands and a sylvan library, which is useless against goblins. I was mulliganing to try to find um, Oath because, you know, I, I kind of had to. And the Gerard's verdict me. And I figure the only way I'm back in this game is if I can draw for the accumulated knowledge. So I'm actually throwing my lands away. I'm just like, please... Please draw land. Please draw land. And I do. Oh, nice. Which is like drawing three cards there, because I get my land plus the two cards off of this. Well, not exactly exciting cards, but I mean, I could Blessing and get an, another card in my hand. I could see two more cards next turn, maybe. Um, well, we'll see. Uh, my opponent... LDs me. Destroys my island. This game looks like utterly hopeless, right? Like, what even is this? What even is this game for me? Like, why am I even playing this? Why am I still playing? Well, the only answer is because there's no pressure on me. It's just horrific, you know, destruction of all of my, of all of my resources. And, uh, but 
no pressure yet. Like if they had a hypnotic specter, I would immediately just concede if I didn't, if I didn't, you know, find a, a source of pleasures. If I didn't find a planes. And insult to injury. Vindicated my last land. I remember those lands I discarded so I could AK? Not looking too smart now. But then again, I am two cards deeper instead of one. So perhaps it counts for something. All right, I'm going to draw a scroll rack here. And uh, I am not sure why things are so slow to uh, continue playing here. Maybe if I close... Um, the uh, internet window that I have open. Uh, maybe if I close my uh, uh, browser, it'll improve performance. It doesn't seem like it. Let's see if we can skip. I'll try to kick it forward. Opponent verdicts me again, takes a guy's blessing and a plow. Now I draw a city of brass. I'm just going to play it despite the fact that he's playing LD. I mean, i got to get lands into play. Sterling Grove, right? But my opponent's kind of stalled out. Oh, great. Just what I wanted to see. Oh, God. This is so painful, right? Opponent gets Frexian Arena into play. Okay, I finally get a land. I'm going to play Scroll Rack first over Grove. I need to, like, fix my hand. Opponent gets a Nantuko Shade. Oh, lovely. Four Spike. I, uh... And then I go ahead and Scroll Rack directly into Oath of Druids. Opponent sends in a Nantuko Shade. And now we see why they were stalling. because They, they were stalled because they... They had a bunch of rituals, so they blast me for a ton of damage. But, of course, the, the Neshoba comes out. I wasteland my opponent, so they only have one white available. So when they go to plow my Neshoba, I'm able to actually counter it. They then pump the hell out of their guy and swing in, hitting me with the Spectre. But the problem is, it doesn't matter that their guy's a 10-9. Neshoba says, uh, prevent all damage and then just take a counter off of it. And then I, I gain, so I gain 7 life here. Um, their guy just didn't do enough to me. And now I get to Oath again, and I've got active glaciers running, a Factor Fiction, and a Scroll Rack. And uh, if you remember, despite the fact that they're, they hit me with a Spectre, and I was very lucky, they, hit the, they took out the Force Spike, the next card I get is either going to be Weaver, which is going to fog them, and the Spectre won't take any cards out of my hand, or it's going to be the, um, the Angel. And then I'm going to be able to attack them with a uh, Vigilance Angel and then a Shoba if I want to, and crack them for 12 and drop them, sorry, for 12. Dropping them to uh, 8 with the arena is going to take them to 7. And jumping up to 19 plus having an untapped angel in play. Or, like I said, get the weaver, fog them, and uh, do the glaciers thing. So my opponent concedes. So remember how far behind I was this game? It was absolutely insane how, like, I had no lands and, like, one card in hand or whatever. Um... Never give up in this format. This is a much more interesting format than a lot of formats you might be familiar with because you have the capacity to do things like that and recover. Um, out, what you can't recover from is 100 million goblins coming into play by uh, turn two, right? Um, but most things you can recover from, uh, not unless you have maybe Pyroclasm, like literally the one card that, that gets you out of such a scenario. So anyway, um, moving on to my opponent here. I lead off with Glaciers, as you do. My opponent leads off with Crows and Verge. I, I respect this a lot. Put two mana in, sack it, get a forest and a plains. I actually really want that in this deck, but I just can't. I need to run Glaciers. Opponent gets a Sylvan Library. This is going to be brutal. they got tons of card advantage going. I do get to waste their Verge and play an Oath here, um, but, you know, now they're paying life with Sylvan. They've got seven cards in hand. This is not where I want to be. I am fortunately running my own card advantage engine out, and I have a counter spell here to protect when they go for a disenchant on the oath so hopefully i can stall with the oath here and get some you know buy some time oh crap they get double ivory tower to go with their sylvan library and meanwhile i'm over here casting disrupting scepter right they're going to be drawing so many cards now it's just brutal and they get a crow's inversion to play i draw a wasteland off the top lovely i'm going to play scroll rack and not scepter them because i really need to uh glaciers I just used that little window earlier to um, to maximize mana efficiency. Are they blessing in cards that they want. They're at six, but they have nine cards in them. They do have to discard a bit. I'm going to go ahead and thaw. I thought I thaw a putty tat. All right, so they discard a land and another Sylvan that they pretty much don't need. And here, I don't have a lot going on, so I'm going to stick them. 
trying to reduce the amount of life. They're going to gain four life, which means a free card this turn, but at least they're not gaining six. You know, it's something. And they double pay going to two. What in the hell? And then they play a card that says uh, all rebels get plus one, plus one. All right, I'm going to full scroll rack here. Why, why would they go to two? That That's just really aggressive. I'm going to thaw during upkeep. I'm looking to kill them, right? And look at that. Time to scepter them. Oh no, time to scroll rack. I'm looking for red mana, and I can't find it. So I play seal cleansing instead, and I kill their sylvan. I kind of want to kill their uh, ivory tower, to be honest. I wish I had gone for red earlier, but, you know, I didn't, I didn't really expect them to take that much damage. All right, here I'm going to stick them to try to keep them off gaining some life for a little bit. And uh, end of their turn, I'm going to scroll rack again. I'm trying to set the kill up. I'm trying to invalidate all that card advantage they got. And at this point, I don't think I can actually do it. They're just going to gain too much life. So they play a rebel and another rebel, obviously, and another rebel. They're off the life gain, but they're too high. So I, I'm not going to be able to... I'm not going to be... So I just oath through the fireball and uh, get my acroma going. Guy's Blessing... Um, with Guy's Blessing's shuffle on the stack, I think I decide to let it resolve. Or maybe I scroll rack. Yeah, I scroll rack. That's fine. Um, I do get to hit him with the Chroma, though, which drops him to six. And we'll stick him. They've only got two cards in hand, so if one's a plow, I can counter, and if the other one's question mark, who knows? Anyway, so they start rebelling, and they get Whip Quarter, who can tap a creature and basically lock it down, and a flyer, a 2-2 flyer, that'll s allow them to survive for the turn, and they play another Crusade. So now it's a 3-3 flyer. That does open the window for me to uh, go ahead and um, thaw here without having to worry about my creature getting plowed. And of course I finally get red. Upkeep, I'm going to Oath. And I hit a Spike Weaver, so guess what? They're dead. Uh, we'll play a little Scroll Rack games just to make sure that that's the optimal solution. Still had that Fell War Stone in here. Really don't need it, I don't think at all. Um, and yeah, I can't, I cannot uh, fireball them. It's still in the deck. But what I can do is just use Weaver's other ability. We'll just move a counter, move a counter, and move a counter over to the Angel. And now it's a 9-9 Trample, and they take six exactly. We get exactsies for the win. And we move into game two. It's fun how all the games are just similar but different you know they're very all right i take a mulligan i didn't my, i didn't care much for my opening hand i brought in some extra disenchants um i really need to take a look at my sideboard currently and consider whether or not i do have enough disenchants because i drew oath i lead off with coast rather than glaciers because i'm thinking if they slam a rebel here i'm just going to go straight into oath possibly and uh seems like that's the plan they don't play a rebel but they play mom Ah, uh, but they have a disenchant. So they mulliganed pretty aggressively, and then Ivory Tower and Mother Rooms is not helping them out either in terms of recouping card advantage. But it is kind of it does kind of get them in a situation where they're not dead. So I impulse and do my next oath. Miss a land drop, but you know, I do have glaciers, so I never miss a land drop for too long with the glaciers running. I have to sit on counter magic here. I play a rebel. Yeah, I'm not. The plan is I'm gonna thaw into four mana and then play oath plus counter backup with counter backup. That is, unless their hand is low enough that I I feel that, you know, ghost is clear. I can't actually plow anything because I'm mother of ruin. So I decide, I'm gonna run bait out and just play a set a stick, and they take it. They take the bait. They disenchant it. Great. And then they're not gonna use their uh, rebel here, and I talk. Oh, I, yeah, I decide I'm going to run a, a guy's blessing and luckily find a land. All right, so they've got four. They were so eager to take that bait that I'm pretty sure they have another disenchant in their hand. So I'm being, I'm taking, I'm being very cautious about waiting on when I play this uh, Ulta Druids. Maybe too cautious, but felt right. And now I think is the time. I've got counter back up. I think they have a a plow if I want to play with Mother of Ruin, Ruins. And sure enough, they do have that confidence was born of disenchant, but they have two more disenchants. 
What the heck? That's four disenchants. And here come the rebels. Well, one of them. So, uh, yuck. Taking a bit of a beating here. Of course, I've drawn all my disenchants. Now you see maybe I have too many, right? So this is why I ended up doing what I've done with the sideboard and finding kind of a happy medium. Or at least I hope it's a happy medium. So, um, they're, they've got a Lin Civy now, and they're in with two rebels. Uh, my ability to uh, dig for oath, however, goes um, continues unabated, and I factor fiction into Oath of Druids and go ahead and thaw. But unfortunately, I milled through three counter spells there, which means not really going to be able to protect this oath. Uh, the likelihood of me finding another counter spell is pretty low. Opponent then Lin Civy's into Whip Quarter, which is going to be able to tap down my Neshoba if I get one. Or my angel. So as a result, they only send in for two. They don't want to attack with mom, which I get. They don't want to attack with Lin Civy because they want to recruit. And they don't attack with the whip quarter because they need to tap whatever shows up. So I factor fiction end of turn and they say fireball or these other four cards. And I say, oh, I'll take those four cards with the factor fictions. And yep, Neshoba pops up. So that's not too great. Here I play an untapped land. Um, you know, I have so many cards in hand that... Um, I, I can I can thaw later. Opponent tutors up another whip quarter and taps down my Neshoba. I throw away some extra thaws and a disenchant. Alright, so now they send in for four, which I have to take, of course. But at the end of their turn, I get to thaw again, and this time factor fiction once more. And there's a counter spell if I want it. And I don't want it. I decide I'm just going to keep digging instead uh, with my impulse. All right, I'm at three now. So during my upkeep, I get an Acroma. I miss my doggone Weaver again. So I play Scroll Rack and activate it. In response, my opponent taps down my Neshoba. All right, with Scroll Rack running, I get to basically grab a gigantic hand. This is like three mana, draw ten or something, right? I get to stack my deck and take a look at a bunch of cards. And unfortunately, I don't find much of anything except my one Pyroclasm. So let's run it out. My opponent taps to give a creature protection from color. I plow in response. They activate Lincivi in response, but that doesn't really do anything. And uh, when the dust clears, all they have left is a whip quarter. The one that got pro red. And I have one Swords to Plowshares in hand. I'm at three. I'm hurting pretty bad. Uh, my opponent does get to use my own oath against me. But remember, I can also plow my own creatures if I absolutely have to. So my opponent's rebuilding there. And I also have Fire Ice as well as Impulse here. So I can do some stuff. One of which is going to be a Fire That Whip Quarter. So now that that thing's not tapping me down, my opponent has to plow. And that means I gain life. A Chroma comes in. Spank. My opponent's at nine. And, um, yeah, I get to uh, Gaia's Blessing, shuffling an Oath of Druids, Impulse, and Disrupting Scepter. And uh, now I get to Oath again. And finally I get my Spike Weaver. And I do the exact same trick that you've seen me do before. The opponent has no cards in hand, so I just move all the counters over and uh, swing in for nine. And... and Kill for Xaxes. Alright, against X bet at uh, 150 AM. Alright, and that was it for basically the rest of these games were played, you know, those were yesterday and, and we've moved into today. Uh, so there's this last game here, and then the last five or six are all gonna be games with um, the closest, if not the exact version of the deck, the closest version but man you can see how important adding pyroclasm just just getting my butt handed to me by the goblins and telling me hey you need to put pyroclasm in your deck and you can see how, how valuable it was right there to uh to win a game where i was at three life and in big trouble without like oath wasn't doing it and when i was playing a fires of Maya deck i hate to see sylvan early i hate to see sylvan early but um super interesting credit to my opponent for playing an old another old school deck that i is a great deck. I'm hoping no Blastoderm comes down. Fortunately, it's just Call of the Herd here. 
that at least I can plow. So let's plow, even though, you know, um, and then wasteland the carpools and forest, gain a little bit of life off the ivory tower. I get bolted. I think they correctly recognize it. They might as well be mana efficient. They play a Fires of Yavimaya. They don't have a fifth mana, so no sapling burst yet. If you're not familiar with these decks, I'm familiar with all of them. So part of the reason why I'm doing well in this format is because I, I literally, like, this is this was my, this is what I cut my teeth on in Magic. So when I see certain cards, I say, I, I already know what to expect. All right. Uh, unfortunately, he's got Sap Burst here, and I, I don't have, I have Cunning Wish now. You notice, no longer have the enchantment. Um, but unfortunately, I don't have um, time to Cunning Wish for a Disenchant before uh, he gets the Sap Sapling Burst. So he bursts me down, hitting me for 12. I go ahead and grab a Disenchant, gain a little bit of life. Play an Oath of Druids. My opponent says, deck's so pretty, and I was, oh man, thanks. Opponent Sylvans pays life. That's definitely the right thing to be doing there. Flashes back that Call of the Herd. Swings in for lots of damage. We're going to um, make Sapperlings go away. I get bolted and beat by the Elephant, but now I gain a little bit of life. Oath of Druids triggers. A Chroma pops in, shows up to the party. Impulse, I'm looking for something to protect my board position here. And I send in a Chroma for six. My opponent has been using Sylvan Library, so they can die very quickly here. Uh, so can I, though. Look at that. Triple fires. Opponent swings in. Uh, well, passes for the turn. I get the Glaciers, which is great. It gives me more life off of the Ivory Tower. I'm going to beat in for six. Again, bringing them to two. They land and pass. But my opponent could actually kill me with just that elephant. Oh, and the sapling burst. Yeah, we're going to um, counter that with buyback. and uh, whew, Dodge a bullet there. Still have a forbid up. I block, but this is actually chump blocking. Because I can make it a 7-7. That's big enough to kill my guy. Yuck. But I get to oath. I don't get any life off of the tower because I did the uh, forbid with buyback thing. But I'm still feeling pretty good here. I get to Oath. I get to Thaw. I grab a Weaver. We're going to reshuffle. And, um, yeah, I find a... I go ahead and just hit my land drop because what I'm hoping to do... I'm going to pick up the Glaciers. That means I get to gain one life off the tower. What I'm really hoping to do is impulse into a Factor Fiction here and make it even more. When it goes for a Flame Tongue here, that's fine. I'm just going to Fog. Get your FTK going. No point in them attacking, and they realize it, so I go ahead and impulse. Find myself a disenchant, and uh, I gain some life. I don't need to rush the disenchant. Let's oath into a chroma, and my opponent's dead. She's back, ladies and gentlemen. I go ahead and disenchant, um, just taking away their ability to play hasted creatures. Send in the chroma, and that's it. All right, so we move on to game two. Okay. And, um, yeah, got a, got a perfectly acceptable hand. We got early interaction and whatnot. And I, I keep looking at these disenchants. I think I need, like, one... I feel like I need a disenchant. I don't know. I'm, I'm hoping that the, the buyback stuff in my sideboard's enough. But it's just so... It's, it's so when when disenchant's good, it's you know it's better than good, right? Because there's almost no other way to interact with certain permanents. Anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and fetch some lands here, and let's get that fires off the board. And I think that might have been a mistake. It was a little aggressive. I could have done it in response to a creature. And also, I would much prefer to kill a sapling burst if I can. Opponent has an answer for uh, oath of druids, so back to square one here. And if they have Sapperling Burster, I could be in big trouble since I threw that Disenchant away. Fortunately, it's just Elephant Flashback. And that means um, I've got time. I mean, I hate to see two six sixes, but I have time to cast Factor Fiction. My opponent blasts in response, and I impulse into um, Plow. Once again, situation somewhat precarious, but not entirely. Let's go ahead and Plow that away, and I'll take three. And we're gonna we're gonna thaw again. Glacier's just so so good. And with that, I can now actually just hard cast. If 
Phantom Neshoba, which is something you don't do too often, but it's obviously very possible in this deck, and it's great to be able to do that. It's great to have that option. And my opponent doesn't have a solution. Probably sitting on Rail Elemental Blasts and maybe Naturalizes, um, but doesn't have a solution for the actual creature itself. And yeah, from there, scoops it up. Very good. And then um, uh, Backfish was the last opponent from last night. And then we get to add the, the little tweaks for today. And man, there's some... Honestly, if you're still sticking with it, I think you're... Hopefully you're enjoying yourself as much as I am. But there's even more um, really stellar games coming up. Some really good stuff happening. All right, my opponent's on Elves, it looks like. Or... Usually, if you see a Wirewood symbol, it's, it's Elves. Yep, there's an Acolyte to start fueling. It's a card-drawing engine there. It's a bit slow because it's two mana to draw a card, but two mana to draw a card's a pretty good deal. Dying Glaciers, on the other hand, one mana to draw a card, but also quite slow because of how you have to deploy it. Let's see if I can get an Oath down and maybe get a win before you know my opponent gets r off to the races too fast. I get an Acolyte into Cradle into Survival, but I do get to Oath... I'm going to go ahead and tutor for the land that I want before I let the Oath resolve because I want to make sure that the land doesn't get milled. All right, and I'm going to disenchant that survival right now as opposed to wastelanding the cradle, and it's really uh, questionable as to whether or not I made the right choice or not. They play an Acolyte. They get a survival anyway. Survival away is Squee. Pick up the Multani. I do get to swing in with the Nishoba, so I clock him for seven. And then I waste the uh, Cradle. But they get to pick up their Squee, and now they have an active survival. So do they have some kind of... They get anger. This could get real bad real fast. And I make a bad play, by the way. Um, all right, they're, they're going off. And here I screw up really bad. I plow that, I think. I don't think that made any sense. Um, but fortunately, they don't pick it up. So I don't get punished too hard. And I kind of wish at the end of their turn and grab a lightning bolt. All right. So impulse for the turn. Grabbing a counter magic. I, don't, I didn't quite see. Oh, I grab a Swords of Plowshares. No, this is the turn where I, where I do my timing wrong. So I plow that, which is fine. Bolt will probably kill anything that they've got, so... The difference from being at six or whatever is. And I bolt this Priest of Titania. I think I say something about timing. Now maybe this was fine. Look at this. They're just going off, man. Remember, everything has haste, so. So bad. So bad for me. And they actually get a giant Drain Sherman in play, have a billion mana. But we kind of run out of gas. And, uh, you know, they can hit me pretty hard there, but then they would lose. So they have to hold back blockers. And then, of course, that lets me oath. And I oath up a chroma and just kill them on the spot. All right. Was that game one? I think that was game one. All right. So going into game two. That was a pretty close thing, though. I take a mulligan. I am not happy with a hand like this against elves. This hand has no... Oh, wait a minute. There's I sideboarded it in rather than having a cunning wish for it. Ah, never mind. That morph is the morph that kills enchantments. And off the top, like a boss, I rip Pyroclasm. I actually should have just sat on it here and let him extend out further. Uh, you know, steal more resources, impulsed, uh, counterspelled anything crazy. Um, but, you know... I did what I did, so... Because I'm so close to being able to... Um, well... If I... It, it, they weren't... They didn't really have a significant amount of pressure on me, and it would have just made a lot more sense to have done it the other way. So anyway, I impulse at the end of their turn, grab a land so that I can get play Oath with counter backup. Play a land, play Oath. They're down to only two cards in hand at this point. Thanks, thanks to them losing two cards for the Pyroclasm. And on their turn. All right. So they send in for two. I take it, obviously. They run a naturalize on my oath. I attempt to protect it. I'm glad to see they did it with their red tapped. They didn't have, like, a pyroblast up. 
And then I oath into Weaver. Any of my two big guys would have been preferable, I think. But it's fine. I mean, this isn't bad. It's it's solid. What I'm mainly concerned about is that while they can't attack me for damage di right at this moment, they might be able to spit out a bunch of cards and then and then start attacking me. Anyway, um, uh, uh, I lost track of what's going on here, but uh, I lost. My, I don't know why my brain just had a shutdown here. I think it's because of the. Um, I'm, I'm on some like pretty pretty strong uh, drug meds there, so I'm sure you as the viewer know what just happened. But I completely lost track. Uh, unfortunately, like kind of my consciousness faded out for a second. Um, very, very unpleasant, the, the situation that I'm in. Anyway, at the end of their turn, I'll go ahead and impulse. And um, I don't see a reason to counter the Drain Hermit. It doesn't significantly change the scenario. And um, pretty much I just want to protect a winning position. I don't need to win more. So I'm perfectly fine with them developing in a way that doesn't change anything. They send in here... I. I could aggressively fire here. I don't have to, but I decide that I will just because it, it interferes that that um, symbiote is part of their combo. Like, I don't want to playing Hermit over and over every turn. So as you can see, um, my guy only loses one counter despite four creatures dealing damage to it. So even if he had done eight to my creature, I only would have lost one counter off of it. Anyway, they go for a Hermit here, and then I do decide that because this represents lethal now, um, because of this has trample, uh, and so there's no way for them to survive six plus uh, four points of trample here. Then I counter because that's not that's not win more. That's just winning, and I'm a, I'm I'm happy to just win, right? So we we go for the win there, and you can see how uh, powerful the pyroclasm, the one pyroclasm, and the one fire ice actually, um, how much more game the deck has by just adding. A few cards, you know, just tweaking the dials ever so slightly, which I'll probably be continuing to do until we get to the the refined final product. But it's it's feeling like I'm much closer. I've definitely got to keep here, especially going first. Hopefully, I don't get therapied for oath if they duress me for oath. Wait a minute, what the hell is this? They're playing sleeper agent. Oh my gosh! Now I can't play oath of druids. Hopefully, they don't have a way to pin it down. I mean, and then of course. Ironically, I just draw more Oath of Druids. Um, but my opponents aren't really doing much of anything, so they, they have Sleeper Agent, which completely confounds my ability to play Oath, If unless I'm willing to risk giving them a... like letting them Oath into more Sleeper Agents, which will pop into my side and just kill... do things to me, but then they incinerate it. I don't fully understand what the decisions behind this deck are. Uh, I But it, it'll become clear... It'll become clear in... Um, either this game or the next. But for now, I'm just going to play a control game. This is fine. This is fine. Let's see if I can take them off red. But before I do, I have an opportunity to factor fiction. I'm going to take it. This is game one, so I'm not expecting like a pyroblast or anything. All right. So let's fact. F off. Fact or fiction. Um, they, uh, in response, though, they... Uh, Brain Geyser, I mean, they draw their own cards, right? Skeletal Scrying for three is rough. All right, Cunning Wishes. You can see the deck's looking a lot more. This is like current version, right? All right, I'm going to take Ivory Tower against what appears to be a burn deck of some sort. A unique, clever version of a burn deck. I think it's kind of cool. And then I end up discarding. You know, I, it looks like Oath is just not going to be good against them, so I'm going to pitch it. They try to duress me. Obviously, I don't want that to happen if I can stop it. And then they play a Slayer. I, the other reason for discarding the Oath was just to convince them to play a creature. And now that I know they don't just have Sleeper Agents, they have other creatures, um, I'm going to play the Oath with that creature on the board. And now, now they just lean into my Oath harder. Um, I, think they're, I think they're making a mistake here. Um, I don't think that was the way to go. I thought they were doing pretty well up to this point, but uh, this just isn't going to work out too great for them. All right, so Akroma is going to reshuffle our graveyard, and yeah, they scoop. They might have Diabolic Edict, and they could kill Akroma, and then they could hit me for four or whatever. I am holding the Weaver after all. I could hard cast the Weaver and just kind of live off of that. 
But, uh, I mean, I have Ivory Tower running with glaciers. Like, Tower Glaciers is super, super strong. So, I'm not super... I'm, like, I'm not really concerned with my life total. And I'd rather just sit and... Pr I don't really think I'd play the Weaver. I'd just protect my myself in other ways. So, All right, game two. Looks good. And Sleeper Agent again. I've, of course, sideboarded, but there's not a lot. I mean, it's not like I'm sideboarding for the Sleeper Agent deck. Incidentally... Along, okay, now you see what their combo is. Paralyze it. So it takes four mana to untap it. And, of course, you know, it's going to do tons of damage to me. And this insulates them against Oath. So I like this. What I actually don't like in their deck are all the rest of the creatures. If you're going to play an anti-Oath burn deck, just play this. Don't play the rest. Uh, and then the story I wanted to tell. Back in the day, I actually had a very interesting deck that I built. It was Sleeper Agent Oath. And the way that it worked was you would play Sleeper Agent and then you would play Oath of Druids and you would only Oath into more Sleeper Agents. And I had um, um, Meek Stone, so they, they couldn't untap. So that's how I locked them down, was with Meek Stone. And it was actually a counter Oath deck and I would just sit there and watch them die. But it wasn't a great deck because if they could deal with the Meek Stone, then the Sleeper Agents actually killed me faster than I could kill them. And also, um, sometimes... Uh, sometimes uh, well, sometimes I would draw sleeper agents, lots of them, but no oath. And then, then it just basically sucked. So I gave up on the deck. I actually like what my opponent's doing much more, like I said, minus the other creatures. I think the paralyzed sleeper agent thing is super cool. I've always said I would add one copy of, uh, of uh, Meek Stone in there, but uh, in addition to all this. But yeah, I really like what they're doing. I mean, look, look how this is just harsh, man. I'm not going to counter that, though, because... Um, well, I mean, I do win the race in theory. Instead, I'm going to impulse. I want to I want to just do exactly what I just did. I want to plow my own sleeper agents and recoup some of this lost life. You can see I brought in um, Blue Blast. All right, I'm going to bang in with mine. So they're at 14. I'm at 11. Not great. I play Wall of Souls, and I, I don't even know why I... Why do I even counterspell this Wall of Souls? Whenever it's dealt damage, it deals that much damage to the opponent. Yeah, who cares? I, I should have let him have it. Anyway, this is fine, though. I mean, next creature I'm definitely not countering. I'm going to plow the agent, and we're both at 11. So this is... It's been rough, but I've basically stabilized, and now I get to start doing um, either Factor Fiction things or Oath of Druid things. So Hopefully they don't Red Blast this. They don't. Wonderful. All right, do I want three cards or two cards? Yeah, I'll take uh, two cards when one of them is an impulse. Um, and then let's go ahead and get that Oath of Druids down. Because at that point, I, I did. I don't really feel like I have time to scroll rack. Like, I don't feel like that's going to be particularly relevant this game. Um, because there's not a lot my opponent can do about They can play a Dystopia. But that's about it. Um, they do play a Sleeper Agent, which I counter. I'm down to five. I oath up into Zoop. Phantom Shoba. Put all those counter spells back in my deck. Find a cunning wish, play a glaciers. I'm of course worried about Prince of Progress. I see all basics over there. Or um, uh, Blood Moon. The guy has shadow, so I can't block. So now I'm down to three. They bolt for the win. I do have, of course, Blue Blast. And then they have Doughty Slayer. And at that point, eh, that's all she wrote, right? I'm going to go ahead and Glaciers. Um, and then the Neshoba's going to quickly turn the tide on this game. If I hit the Angel here, I just kill them on the spot. I do not. I hit Spike Weaver instead. And draw my Compost. So I, I sideboarded in four Blasts and a Compost, I think, is what I did. And that's it. We move on to next Valenzue Valenz Valenzuela. Valenzuela. I like it. All right. <clears throat> and uh, I've got to take a mulligan. I'm going mulligan down to an inacceptable hand. I have Otha Druids in my hand, whether or not you can see it. My opponent leads with a swamp. I should have led with an island here because they led with a swamp, because by playing planes... They just guessed Swords to Plowshares correctly. If I played Island, they would have guessed Counterspell incorrectly. Oops. Got to think about what my opponent's doing. I throw away a stick here. Later on, I'm going to regret that, but um, I ice them as well for tempo. They play in Nintuko Shade. 
So I'll go ahead and play a forest. And remember what I said in the beginning. They funeral charm me, I lose a land. But if you have plains, island, forest, and cunning wish, you actually have Oath of Druids. So they get a hippie, uh, hypnotic specter. They're doing the hippie, hippie shake over there. All right, so I tutor. I, I wish for Enlightened Tutor. I Enlightened Tutor for Oath. I play a land drop, play the Oath. I don't play my Wasteland because I don't see... I'd rather have two blue and play. I'm going to lose my cards anyway. And I'm expecting to take pretty big beating here. And I do. Whack me for 10. But I get to Oath. And we'll Oath into a Chroma. All right. And uh, Glacier's off the top. It's pretty solid. Chroma could die here to a... Edict, though, and that's exactly what happens. My opponent then swings in for four, five, six. I really do not want to hit a freaking Phantom Neshoba. I really want to hit a Weaver. Something that will save me. I hit a Neshoba. Okay, well, I mean, as long as they don't have more removal. Oh, wait a minute. Ah, why couldn't I have just hit a Weaver? So I was pretty unhappy about that. So I lose game one. And then game two. This is one of the most epic games you'll ever see, provided the replay doesn't bug on us. Another, like, banger, like, amazing, amazing, amazing game, from my point of view, anyway. If, if, I'm, if I'm correct, I believe this is the one. Um, all right, so I lead off on Island this time, um, and I'm just going to slam Oath before they can rip it out of my hands. My opponent Funeral charms me. I, I throw away the Weaver. It's fine. We can get it back later. Plays a land and passes. Um, I play a land and you know I've got counter magic up. I don't want to. I don't want to take my shields down if I can help it. So I'm not going to do anything here. I go for an arena. I 100% do want to counter that. I don't want them drawing two cards per turn. All right, land's great. I can impulse in response to something. I can, or I can just blessing here and uh, improve my hand. I put my counter spell back in my deck. Ah, oh, they have a second arena. Dang it. Maybe I should have waited and done the blessing later. So I impulse and look at, oh, 100% I should have waited. Damn it. Bad playing, Nate. And I'm going to be a punish for that real hard now, of course, because now they're drawing two cards per turn. I've got glaciers. And in this version, I don't know if I have any disenchants. They go for Sabo's Web, and I decide to counter it because I'm concerned about glaciers not untapping. Oh, this is game two. Yeah, that's right. Um, and then they play Planar Void. So now whenever a card goes to the graveyard, it gets exiled. And then Dystopia. So that compost that I was like kind of in my head fist pumping, yes, I got Compost Oath down. I'm pretty safe. Not so safe anymore. I go ahead and um, grab some land, and then I've got to throw something away. I'm going to throw away the Oath, hoping that you know they'll, they'll walk into the trap here and um, play a creature thinking, you know, hey, he doesn't have Oath anymore. Of course, they pay the upkeep on Dystopia as well as their arena. And I'm still not exactly clear on what's going on. Like, I don't know exactly what they're doing. They duress me, which is interesting. Um, so I get to draw a card off the compost from the duress. So they duress me for um, nothing. And then I get to draw a card and I draw a counter spell, which is fantastic. I think they realize their mistake here because they floated some extra mana and then decide against casting anything. Which makes sense. Until the dystopia clears out the compost. Rough. Okay. So they are now taking even more damage should they choose to keep that dystopia in play. And they decide to let it go. So they're not going to they're not gonna keep uh, taking big chunks out of the life total. Start to tap mana and decide against making a play. Which is really interesting. I don't know if I've got them spooked or what. So I'm going to go ahead and thaw. Grab my uh, mountain there. And uh, they end up discarding. They have too many cards in hand, so they discard a smother. And remember how I shuffled a counterspell back into my deck? Well, I've drawn two of them since then. And I, I made a comment. I said, I see I should have brought in Disenchants. I'm really disappointed in myself. They go ahead and uh, make me discard again with Funeral Charms. So I throw away City of Brass. They play another Planar Void. I'm not going to fight over it. It's it's kind of already, it's kind of already um, a big problem for me. And um, I... But... It, it's a problem that is essentially um, one that uh, where nothing I do about it's going to matter anyway. Like if I counter that now and the other one's still active, it doesn't make any sense. I go ahead and pick up the glaciers on purpose 
um, here I, I have to counter their Cabal Therapy, of course, which at least gets exiled. So I pick up the Glaciers on purpose because if they continue to Funeral Charm me here, I wanted to have extra Glaciers. Like if they go Charm Charm, I wanted it in my hand before the turn starts. They play a disc, and I'm not going to fight over a disc. In fact, I would really love for them to pop that thing right now. Can I borrow that? All right, they're at 12, and they tap out and go for a Corrupt. And I think about it, and I know that future... I really don't want them getting life, but future corrupts are going to get worse. So I decide I'm going to let it go. I have a game plan in mind to try to win this game. The first step here is tutoring for uh, scroll rack. Now that I've used all the... I've sucked all the juice out of the glaciers, let's, uh, let's go ahead and scroll rack and see what we can find. And now you know what my game plan is. It's staring at you right in the face. It's... Uh, fireball, right? They are taking damage with Arena. I'm going to try to kill them like Necro killed them. Slow Necro killed them. They run out of Nantuko Shade. I'm not going to counter that. If I can't, if I don't have to counter, I'm not going to counter, and that's mostly fine. They go for a Drain Life. X is 3. It's not big enough to counter either. I hate it because they're back at 20, but I just can't afford to waste counters on small ball stuff. I need to go for the big, the big stuff. Here, I'm going to take the 3 pile, and uh, unfortunately, that means I lose my Neshoba. But I, my, my expectation is, and I have to give him two more life. But my expectation is that Neshoba just isn't going to live if I took it. Now I can scroll rack and uh, uh, protect my fireball by sticking it on the top of my library. And because I want to, I want to fireball them. I'm going to go ahead and impulse first uh, to grab the fireball back into my hand before I factor fiction and grab more fuel for my scroll rack. And lucky me, they're letting me do all this with the scroll rack nonsense. All right. And now I get to end step um, factor fiction. And so I'm actually keeping up with the arena in terms of raw cards. And here, I, I think I'm going to choose the, yeah, I'm going to choose the forbid because it's, it's vital that I don't let them gain enough life to actually make it so that they're out of range of me having any potential to fireball them. And you have to realize that essentially they're taking two damage per turn. They just don't know it. They're taking one damage from Arena and one damage every time I hit a land drop, which I've been able to consistently do. Okay, well, here I am going to have to throw away a land. I think Forbid with Buyback when I have the opportunity makes the most sense, so I'm going to do that here. And uh, it's it, I, don't, I don't love it, but um, again... So I'm going to go ahead and tuck away a few cards. I'm looking. Remember, I want to keep hitting land drops. I don't want to keep... Oh, yeah, I had one mana leak in the sideboard that I sideboarded in for some reason. I think because I was expecting them to throw gigantic um, drain lifes at me and then I could mana leak them. You know, that was the theory. Don't love it here, but, you know, whatever. They finally realize they need to pop the disc. So, okay, I'm going to scroll rack one last time. And this is how I've got myself set up. So their arena's gone. Their voids are gone. They have seven cards in hand. At the end of all that business, they end up with seven cards in hand, and I end up in a pretty good spot. And then they go for arena, and I think about it. I impulse in response, and I don't counter the arena. I let them have it, because my game plan is to necro kill them. And I think I've got enough counter magic built up that they're not going to be able to resolve like a corrupt or a giant drain life before I can actually finish them off. So I'm, it's a huge gamble to let them have that arena, but I believe it's the correct line to take. All right, so they go for, yep, planar void, sure, go ahead. We're not fighting over your over your um, sideboard cards anymore. And then they go for, that planar void was obviously like their attempt at baiting me. Uh, unsuccessful. All right, I'm going to counter that. Now that is like, how many counters have I played? Still had the lousy Felwar Stone in here. I can't remember what that... Oh, that's the Stroke of Genius. Imagine if this was Stroke of Genius right now, right? Uh, anyway. Oh, well. Let's go with the lousy Felwar Stone in my hand. They go for a Cabal Therapy. They know I have Forbid, so I've got a Forbid with buyback. This is incidentally... So they did not pick up an extra point. Like, I didn't deploy an extra land, which would get them closer to Fireball range right there. And now I feel like, you know what? I've got to stop this shade or it's... It's just lethal. I don't have time to win. And they're out of gas. I'm assuming they're holding creature removal. Oh, thank goodness. Cutting wish off the top. And for some reason, 
This is a card you own from outside the game. Doesn't say from exile, so I can't actually get a card that's in exile. I have to get. Oh, uh, they go for funeral charm to get cards out of my hand. Of course, this is choice discard, so I snap that uh, factor fiction in the sideboard into my hand and uh, do a factor fiction, and my opponent splits in a one-four sl split like that. Beautiful. I'll take it. Goodbye, thawing glaciers. I am just hanging on by the skin of my teeth, right? All right, we're going to impulse into a blessing. And then I do the math and realize I think I got them. Fire ice them. They're down to 14. Game plan initiated. Slam the land. And after uh, this incredible game of cat and mouse against a Frexian arena and a sideboard and a bunch of discard and everything else. Fireball you for 13. 13. Almost kills him. Of course, uh, that's a bit of a joke. Because uh, I'm doing exactly what I said I was going to do. Letting them kill themselves with their Phyrexian Arena. There it is. 14 points of damage. And my opponent says... He says, 45 counters. And I say, one for each will drain life, I guess. And he says, rat player. Rat player. <laughs> the things that people say crack me up. Rat player. Also, incidentally, from his perspective, I had 45 counters, right? But you know what the build is in, in this deck, right? Is this it? Is this, is this a deck of 45 counters? And the reason there was no game three is my opponent had two minutes left on the clock, and I had like nine. Let's see, 45 counters. Hmm? Uh, not quite. Four, five. Five counter spells is all I played him with. However, I shuffled in a counter spell. That made six. And I forbid with my back twice. So that made seven, eight, and then ultimately nine, the last one out of my hand. So with five counters, I actually countered nine times and beat them. Uh, that was uh, that was such a good game, man. What a good game. That was incredibly hard fought. Um, okay, so next is uh, Yum Cow. Not not Young Cow, but Yum Cow. Delicious Cow. And Yum Cow, uh, oh, I was going to say, is playing. I was dorking around with Recall here at doesn't belong in this deck, I don't think. I, I realized after this that um, Gaia's Blessing is Recall. It's And um, my opponent is playing the Rock, clearly. And, uh, you know, I've got I've got an Oath of Druids and a Scroll Rack, so let's just go ahead and Scroll Rack, find ourselves a green mana, and then we win. Or not. Okay, let's impulse past all that crap and find ourselves a green mana. Before my opponent Cabal Therapies away all of my Oath of Druids, please. Another Ball Blossoms comes down. I'm going to Impulse. And grab myself a Plow. There's that Recall. All right, don't need it. Let's go ahead and grab ourselves a green mana, please. Not only do I not find a green, I don't find any mana. Nor do I even find a way to dig because I don't have a fourth land because I grabbed Plow instead of Wasteland earlier. I drain their upkeep. I'm going to tap their bird and draw a card just to get a little bit further down into my deck. And fortunately, they stall out with a tap treetop village. Okay, look. Scroll rack. Find me some freaking green mana or another impulse would probably be okay. Holy crap. It does. Only it finds me some green mana and every single creature. If I don't actually scroll rack... I'm hosed, although I could recall them into the graveyard. Oh, with all the Druids trigger on the stack, I get to decide how to set this up and what I want in play and what I want to mill through, which is recall. And now everything is all right. I got a Necroma. My opponent concedes. Holy crap, that was like really rough. And then they, they just don't want to, they don't want to play anymore. All right. And then we move on to Clever Owl. That was just like, Without scroll rack, that was 100% not even close to, you know, winnable, right? Oh, well, my opponent 
I, I don't know what happened there. They just joined and quit. And then Guy Fieri Ball, a name that I do appreciate. And uh, having just one with a gigantic Fieri Ball myself, um, kind of chuckled at, uh, joins up. And uh, this, this opponent's almost always a challenge. I recall this person being pretty pretty cool player and also a pretty strong player. All right. So I'm going to lead off with an island here. Um, you know, I, I have a keep, I think, because I've got Oath of Druids. I've got Fire Ice, which allows me to either kill something or cycle it. When I see an island, I'm pretty happy because my hand is a little sketchy against aggro, but much happier uh, against control. So I'm thinking, okay, cool. There, I haven't played control in a while, but my deck's well set up to fight a control battle. And um, so I'm thinking, you know, this, this looks good, right? Well... My assumptions are not exactly going to be correct on that score. Because it turns out my opponent's playing Madness. Ah, oh, crap. That's not a control deck. That's an aggro control deck. But I rip a green off the top. We're going to slam both the Druids. And do it. don't daze me, bro. Oh, he doesn't, but he foils me instead. I'm foiled again. Island, Coast, and Foil. Then... Um, uh, pitches to Aqua Amoeba and gets a gets an arrogant worm in the play. Ugh. This isn't great, man. It's not great. So what do we do here? Well, we've got to get past our upkeep. Magic online, I know you can do it. Ooh, Ivory Tower. This is this is okay. I mean against aggro, it's not completely horrible to be gaining life, possibly. Although it's gonna be hard to keep cards in my hand. I do have ice here, so I can stall and gain four life. Oh, no. Opponent counters it. So that's not only going to not give me life, nor dig me a card. It also took a card out of my hand for every tower. Unfortunately, somehow he got caught up with the magic online bug and wasn't able to attack there. So he missed seven points of damage. All right. So at the end of my turn, with his last card, he, he, uh, he's going to play a Basking Rule, and I'm going to Factor Fiction in response. And he says, do you want four cards or do you want Oath of Druids? And I'm like, oh, I'll take four cards. All right. So he sends in for a lot of damage. Uh, three, six, ten damage. Beats me down to six, discarding a card in her hand. But with the four cards, I uh, get to gain life off that Ivory Tower. The tower that looked like it might not be too useful this game is looking very useful right now. Um, now, had my opponent not missed his attack... I'd be dead, right? And in written paper, I'd be dead. I'm going to go just fireball that thing and s stabilize pretty well here. Goes for a gush. I definitely don't want that happening, so we'll counter that. And swing in and hit me for a point, maybe three if he wants to pitch an island. He does not. So with uh, Ivory Tower on the stack, I'm going to factor fiction, I believe. Yeah. So that I can, uh, and my opponent gives me Oath or four cards. This time I'm taking Oath, I, so I don't gain any life off of the uh, off of the Ivory Tower, but I do get to slam Oath here, and ba and basically it's disenchant Oath or die. He doesn't disenchant Oath, so he dies. Right? He gets hit me for three. I can't gain any life here, but we know that now it's stabilization time. And this is a bit of a cheese win, and I tell him that um, if it looks like I'm going to win the next game, I'll go ahead and concede so we can play the third game because he should have won this game. It was just a Magic Online thing. But I did want to play it out and see if I could actually uh, get the win. And, um, I mean, the bottom line is... Uh, come on. Can we... Oh, yeah, I get an Acroma. I have a counter spell. I ice his forest just to make it with the counter magic backup. Factor fiction with Ivory Tower on the stack and counter spell prepared. My opponent has no cards in hand. Game's super over. Okay. <clears throat> so moving to game two. Um, I mulligan a couple times and concede exactly like I said I was going to, and we move into game three. So it did mess things up. Um, but, you know, we're back on track a little bit. And uh, I get to go with this hand. Looks good. Yeah, I'll keep it. I'm going to lead off with Glaciers. Let's see what happens. 
soon as I can go get a planes, this hand gets a lot better. I'll go ahead and play the coast. I, I would love for my opponent to waste on my coast here and, and, and let me thaw or waste on my thaw. Either one would make me happy. Said my opponent plays Island Crypt. Doesn't have an Aqua Amoeba. So it looks like what he did was he sideboarded in some control cards. And I'm loving that because, as I said, this deck wants to play against control. So when my opponent takes their aggro deck and sideboard in control cards to try to control the game rather than just kill me, um, it favors me, actually. All right, so I've got Plow stood up. Next, we're going to um, we're gonna get uh, Reb on board. The Reb, the Red Elemental Blast. All right, so we got that active. And now I can do the double thawing glaciers, like where I play one, use one, play one, use one, and, and just churn. And my opponent's missing land drops. Painful, painfully missing land drops over there. I'll go ahead and do this so I don't telegraph that I have... Um, first of all, I, I have nothing to plow. I want to hide the fact that I have the plow. And then secondly, I also want to make it look like I'm leaving blue mana on tap, you know, and I could potentially have something. Here I've got so many cards. I decide I'm not going to even bother with the double... Glacier thing. Single Glacier is going to be enough. Put it, get some Mongrel down. Um, that is fine. They have no cards in their grave, so it's a great time to plow. Because if they want to circular logic this, they have to go in pretty hard. So they discard a, a deep analysis. They float a blue. They gush. They And they pitch to foil in order to count it. That works for me. Not even going to red blast that. I'm just going to... That was just that was just bait, basically. I want to Oath. So I get the oath down. They come in with the dog. Dog. And uh, I saw at the end of their turn with a um, red elemental blast up. And my opponent has a naturalized. I, I didn't have a distant chance, so, you know, it is what it is. We let it go. And right off the top, I, I grab a oath of druids. So now I decide what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually guy his blessing and see if I can. I'm going to shuffle in cards that they don't want to draw. One of which is Deep Analysis, and then I'm plowing their Wild Mongrel. So now their Deep Analysis is not in the graveyard for them to flash back. And I also shuffle in one of their islands. So, I mean, I'm sure they want to draw lands, but it's not really great for them. Here, a gush. Yeah, I am going to I am gonna Red Blast that. They play another Crypt. Fine with me. We are playing Glacier Games. They've gushed, and now I get to Wasteland uh, their Coast off the board. All right, wasteland, they're coast to coast. Their lands are a ghost. Okay, so now, um, you know, my opponent obviously draws and replays one of their islands, and I get to thaw again. Of course, I could play the uh, oath here, but against against black, I would be slamming that oath into play. But against blue, I'm going to hold it and time it uh, against blue-green, trying to uh, get a trigger. And if I don't, well, oh, my friend, scroll rack off the top. Let's use it. And now I have exactly one basic land left in my deck. It's that island. So I just, I had none, but I now have one. So we'll hit a land drop here again. And you know how this works. Look, look. Uh, against, uh, at this point, because my opponent, it would be really exceedingly hard for them to counter here. And I'm winning hard now with the combination of thawing glaciers and multiple counters in a scroll rack. I go ahead and deploy the oath in order to give them something that they have to... Um, they're going to have to figure out a solution to that before they can get threats down. And and so rather than fight a counter war over that, I'm going to fight a counter war to protect that or just let it go and um, and shift from the game being about an Oath of Druids game to the game being about a card advantage game. So we're going to shift gears. Excuse me. We're going to shift gears, and that's what we're going to do here. So during their upkeep, I'm going to go ahead and thaw. Okay, getting that last island, the one that I put back. And then I'm going to put Thawing Glaciers down, and then I'm going to use... I, I decide rather than rather than using Thawing Glaciers to run the scroll rack, because there's three more of them in the deck, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it back into the deck and get new cards, and then I'm going to ET it away. All right, so let's, uh, let's rack away the uh, Glaciers. I do probably don't need the Bolt either, and that's about it. I don't want to scroll back anything else away. The bolt that I obviously sideboarded in. And now we'll ET, we'll phone home for... Uh, one has got six cards in hand, by the way, so they could fight a counter war. What do you get here? Well, I chose Stick. I did, in fact, leave a Scepter in against a Madness deck because Madness likes to dump its hand and then 
um, use top deck counters to maintain control of the game, and um, that's pretty hard to do when you um, when you're getting sceptered. All right, they did have a deep analysis, maybe the one that I shuffled back in. So they get to uh, play that from the graveyard. I'm going to try to counter that because I certainly don't. I, I'm trying to scepter them out. They have a daze. I'm going to try to counter again. And they're out of free counters. And mostly I, I wouldn't normally fight over that. I'd let them have it and just keep my two counter spells. But because they're, because they're so tight on mana and the Oath of Druids is suppressing them and sceptering them is, is, is the game plan here, um, and because I had an extra counter spell in my hand, and in this case two, um, for all those reasons, I go ahead and actually fight that war, that counter war, over something fairly irrelevant. It just means that it takes longer to stick them. I'm going to go and scepter a card away, two two cards away. I, I know I'm going to draw a counter spell. There's nothing that two blue can do except maybe Hercules Recall or something. So I I can. It's okay to. It's okay to. I said scepter. It's okay to rack away two counters and then draw one when you know that there are no instants they can play that are going to punish you for that. And in fact, it's optimal to do it that way. All right. Take another days out of their hand. I am sticking them for days, apparently. And uh, we're going to set up here a little bit further. You can see this is the, the full version of the deck. All right. I don't necessarily, like, yeah, sure, I could fireball this opponent in a which would be quite ironic, actually, given their name, um, to death. But that's uh, we're still a long way away from that. They have five cards in hand, so I am not actually um, in the market for in the mood to be playing my city of brass. I'm going to use that to uh, to uh, scroll rack deeper. What I'm looking for is an impulse, factor fiction, uh, a way to shuffle glaciers, guys, cradle, something like that. I also have those two crypts that are in play. I've got to keep in mind. So I'm going to be a little bit careful as far as Oath goes because I could Oath, honestly, like, Oath most of my deck away, hit a Blessing trigger, then my opponent crips me. If they can deal with the creature from there, uh, I could be in bad shape. Love to see them use a careful study. It's actually card disadvantage. I'm very happy. They just went from four cards to... They went from five cards to four when they played an island and three when they played a careful study. Two when I stick them again. Stifle, um, also somewhat ironic because they could stifle the uh, scepter trigger, but they would still end up with the exact same situation <laughs> as if they didn't stifle it. So it's just kind of funny to take a card like that out of their hand. And you notice I'm not, unlike unlike decks that are running fetch lands, what is he going to stifle here? I mean, maybe a wasteland, but outside of that, you know, I mean... All right, so I've, I've patiently waited to redraw all the cards that I knew that were on top that I didn't want. They get a root wall here and chooses to play it. He didn't have to. I think that's just very, like, wild. I guess the scepter is is breaking his mind there and he's decided that he's going to try to win with a root wall uh, against an Oath of Druids. Um, but that... I, just because I haven't had time to set everything up quite yet, I go ahead and just bolt the thing. I mean, I'm winning by so much that uh, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and stick for f or uh, scroll rack for four. And now you can see when I say I'm winning by so much, it's like I'm going to impulse back into the counter spell, get rid of the stuff I don't want. Okay, beautiful. Now we're doing the thing. We're really doing it. I'm going to stick them again. Uh, I don't even know what he discarded here. Did we... Uh, Oh, he discards a Stifle. Another Stifle. Okay. Yeah, that deck's such a tempo deck that if you get this far ahead, I mean, Thawing Glacius is just basically... Between the Wasteland that's, that screwed his green up and the Thawing Glacius is just... I'm going to factor fiction here. Actually, it doesn't matter if this resolves too much. I'm going to try to protect it because I have an extra counter. And, uh, yeah, I mean, he's trying to figure out what the optimal pile is. It doesn't matter. The three pile is is generally speaking the one that I want when I have scroll rat going. He crips me. Oh, yep, sure. Get a little uh, little vengeance there on me or something. I don't know. All right, glaciers. All right, I can play another blue source. Go and stick him for the last card in his hand. And now my opponent's, you know, sure, completely out of gas. And their scepter locked. 
And from here, I'll go ahead and just blow the, dis <laughs> the disenchant on their uh, Tormod's Crypt, pun intended. And uh, yeah, now we're just doing Scorwack things. Scorwack Scepter things. And now, of course, I've got um, Wasteland for their own, one of their green sources, right? But I also have Carpet of Flowers, which is going to allow me to just hard cast a Chroma. Now, dis Dismantling Blow, by the way, I could pay the kicker and actually draw two cards. And it's really a good way to destroy your own Oath of Druids when you're, when you're done with it, which I am done with it. However, because my opponent had the Crypt and I didn't want to risk, like, I didn't want to deal with the Tormund Crypt being in play anymore, I decided to uh, pitch it now. And then with Scroll Rack, I can ensure that I'm not going to get stuck with Gaia's Blessing in my hand. And if I get to Oath, I can, I can recur what's left of my deck. Um, alternately, of course, I could factor fiction and cause that to trigger the, um, to the, the blessing. So, you know, it's all, it's all fine here. My opponent can Oath, and he does, and he gets a flying root wallow because he has wonder. I'm not going to cast factor fiction. I'm just sitting here protecting my, because then I'd be, I could potentially be casting it into a counter spell or ice or anything else. You just don't do anything when you have a scepter. I'll grab three mana for three and stick. Oh, and there goes a foil. And this is exactly why you don't cast until you've emptied their hand. So if he draws and plays the land, boom, I punish that by playing Factor Fiction. If he draws and holds, I punish that by using a stick. Or I can do like this, and during his upkeep, Factor Fiction. I'm going to take the Neshoba pile because I'm a little worried about um, the potential for running out of threats. And if my opponent does nothing, then I'll just activate Scroll Rack. And then stick them again. And this is just sort of a class in how to use the Disrupting Scepter correctly. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, if you've never done it, if you've never had the joy of Scepter locking your opponent, now you get to see why the card is in the deck. All right, he discards the logic. He can put the Madness on the stack or whatever, but it doesn't matter. I'm not, I have no spells. I'm going to main phase Factor Fiction. And finally, 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 he, 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 he packs it in, right? So, it, I think he finally realizes, like, it's, it's just infinite. I mean, how many, how many Factor Fictions did I actually play that game? I forgot to count. But there was another one coming. We played so many Factor Fictions because we recurred them with the um, Oath. And it's just, it's just endless, endless card drawing. Pretty cool stuff. And uh, that was game three. Yeah, game one. Um... I won technically, but con uh, conceded game two. Uh, I won technically, he won, but technically I won because he didn't actually click to attack in a tournament online. I would, I would not concede. Uh, but then, this is practice, so I scoop game two and then game three, uh, get the win, and that's it. So the deck, other than the before I had the extra red removal, the losses against the goblin deck, and then later you saw me um, do well against goblins and stuff. And you saw the sort of metamorphosis of the uh, the evolution of changes that occurred as, as, as we were kind of moving forward in time. Um, I'm really interested in what you think. Hopefully you enjoyed watching this. Which deck did you enjoy most? Did you like tri do you like tricks? Do you like Psychotog? Do you like Oath? What, what's the most fun to play? Which one um, which ones appeals to you greatest? Uh, and uh, what suggestions might you have if you have any for this deck? Do you think perhaps perhaps for example, by the way, one of the reasons for running Misdirection, just, you know, if you're curious, uh, because it never really came up in the, in the thing, is that Force of Will's ban, Misdirection isn't... It gives you the possibility of doing something like like um, first turn Ivory Tower, second turn Oath, and then they disenchant it. You misdirect from the Oath to your own tower. You don't feel good about it, but if the Oath lives, you feel pretty great about it, right? And of course, if my opponent is playing like that guy playing all the Sylvan Libraries and stuff, more than happy to misdirect his naturalizes over to his own and disenchants over to his own stuff. But also, it's force of will for blue, right? I, if I'm playing against like that guy, uh, Guy Fieri Ball there, and he, he casts a foil and discards two cards, and I have misdirection and like an impulse or something, I can misdirect his counter back and uh, actually play a force of will game. So I kind of like that. And uh, there's a there's a couple other things where it can it can be useful. It's not good against duress, by the way, because duress says target opponent. But there are some scenarios where uh, where it, it, it can be helpful. 
outside of just disenchants and uh, counter spells. Enough that I think maybe just having one is good. But maybe this should be another disenchant. Maybe I need more. You notice I'm, I'm, I'm pretty light on them. I've got the dismantling blow, and then I've got the ones that have buyback. And that's it. One for artifacts, one for enchantments. You know, and that's all. Maybe, maybe this isn't enough. What do you all think? Um, one of the other cards that I thought about for the sideboard is, uh, is Firestorm. It's one red instant. It's one red. It's an instant. And uh, you discard X cards of your choice to deal X damage to X targets. So if they have, like, a Spectre, two Hypnotic Spectres, right? Assuming that those haven't been hitting you in the face. Uh, you, you would Cunning Wish for, like, Firestorm. And for one red, you discard two other cards and you deal two damage to two targets. So it costs you three cards to kill two cards. So it's not a great card, but sometimes it's a get-out-of-jail-free against a, a very cluttered board, especially when you're factor-fictioning into a bunch of stuff. Um, and I decided I'd rather probably just run Lightning Bolt or maybe more Pyrocosms, but it's an interesting card that I have considered for the sideboard. Constant Mist never came up. Constant Mist, of course, being extremely good with Thawing Glaciers. And also a way to sacrifice basic lands that you can then recur and you can then f pull out with glaciers and you can actually get yourself into an infinite fog even though you don't have, spi like say, Spike Weaver's not in the game. So it's another way you can actually infinitely fog up the game, which is kind of cool. Um, and then as far as the other cards on the sideboard, I think most of them we saw, uh, uh, Stifle never came up, but there are, there are uh, circumstances where that can be quite good, and you certainly would sideboard it in against any wasteland deck. And just having, just having that extra little, you know, helpful um, disruption against certain decks can be can be quite nice. But that's all I've got. Hopefully, um, I'm looking forward to any comments that y'all have. Hopefully, you enjoyed yourself. Um, I'm, I'm I'm quite curious to see what everyone thinks about the format. And if you're interested, be sure to go check out the website. Remember, this is um, pre-modern, so just you know, look up the pre-modern website. And, uh, you know, build a deck for yourself and let's see what you got. Or, uh, or at the very least, contribute uh, your thoughts here and hopefully we'll improve this one or one of the others. Anyway, that's all I've got for now, though. Hopefully my neck is actually really killing me, so it's time for my meds. And uh, thank you very much for watching. I'll see you next time.